All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Abdurazak Takriti, uh, and I uh, am the director of the Center uh, for Arab Studies at the University of Houston. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be hosting uh, this uh, book discussion uh, of Omar Shahabi's important volume, uh, Contested Modernity. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that led us to uh, decide to host this uh, event uh, is the fact that the uh, Arab world currently is facing a huge amount of challenges uh, relating to uh, three essential angles. One uh, is a political angle. We have a political crisis facing the entire region, uh, including Bahrain. Uh, the crisis of uh, uh, how uh, the regimes uh, in power uh, reflect or do not reflect uh, popular sovereignty. We have an economic crisis uh, um, manifested in uh, the uh, hegemony of neoliberal uh, modes of economic exchange and governance. And uh, we're also confronted by an ongoing colonial crisis uh, that uh, is seen uh, in uh, the presence uh, of foreign forces in the region and the persistence uh, of uh, this foreign control uh, of the entirety of the Arab world. So given uh, these three factors, uh, a book like uh, that of Professor uh, Shihabi's uh, is essential because it looks at uh, a small country like Bahrain from all three angles. Uh, it, and it grounds the, its discussion of that country uh, in uh, the social dynamics of that space, it does not actually uh, surrender the need uh, to examine uh, these social dynamics in a very deep way. Uh, it looks at the intellectual history of that space, uh, and it looks at the uh, um, intervention of foreign forces as, it, as that intervention intersected uh, with local powers. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, uh, to be hosting this uh, event. And I'm also very excited by the distinguished lineup of speakers uh, that we have uh, discussing this uh, this book. Firstly, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Professor uh, Amal Ghazal, uh, who is uh, currently the Dean of uh, uh, Social Sciences at uh, the Doha Institute. Uh, um, and uh, there, uh, she is uh, really leading a, a fantastic graduate program uh, in the region, and, and she is shaping that program in very profound ways. But before assuming the, that uh, prominent uh, administrative post, uh, she of course had a long history of scholarship, uh, uh, including on the Gulf. Uh, her first book uh, in particular uh, was uh, groundbreaking when it came to looking at the intellectual history of that region and to situating it uh, in uh, oceanic and transnational dynamics uh, of uh, in intellectual exchange. Uh, so I'm particularly honored uh, to be introducing Amal, who, who happens to be also an old friend. Uh, and uh, we'll start with her, and then we'll move on uh, to our other distinguished speakers. Please go ahead, Professor Ghazal. Uh, the honor is mine, Abed, and call me Amal. <laughs> I'm your, uh, you know, your friend from years back, so that's fine. Uh, yeah, I'm so pleased. Pretend, we pretend that we're using titles, Amal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a lot of them, so let's skip them for now. Um, so first, thank you for the invitation. And I feel like my world is coming together at this moment. Vancouver, the US, Matteo from Venice, Doha, everybody's here. That's great. And uh, well, Omar is the one in Vancouver now. And that gave me yet another privilege. Uh, when I was in Vancouver, and uh, Omar and I had so many discussions about Gulf studies in particular. And, um, um, you know, as you know, with my book on Zanzibar, that was my introduction to Gulf studies. I gave a talk at, at the Doha Institute here for the students taking uh, an inter uh, cross disciplinary uh, course. And I found myself, as I was recording my lecture, saying that I came to Gulf studies through African history. And the reason I'm saying this is to highlight one thing here that Omar kind of, of um, you know, addressed in one way or another by filling a huge gap is that 
when we do Arab history, we don't do justice to Gulf studies at all, and we don't do justice to the, to, to the Gulf region at all. So, you know, someone like me who did Arab history in Beirut, I discovered, you know, the Gulf in Canada when I did African history, and I encountered the Gulf on, in, in East Africa more particularly, and this, is, this was my path into Gulf studies. And this is important to say because, you know, as, as we do Arab history and as especially um, those of us who are interested in the Nahda in particular, the Gulf never featured anywhere in the literature we, we studied and uh, we read. And for me to find the Nahda in Zanzibar was like a discovery, a revelation. But of course, it pointed to shortcomings in our methodologies when we study Arab history. Uh, shortcomings in the sources we use overall. And, um, and this is a theme, recurrent, a recurrent theme when I talk to Omar, in a way, what are we doing to bring Gulf studies in, in general into the broader uh, realm of, of Arab history? And I think the Nahda is a very good framework to address this, because wherever we go in, in, in any direction in what we call the Arab world, it's present in different ways, and it's answering so many questions. And I think in the context of Omar's book, as he is addressing ethno-sectarianism, going back to the Nahdan. And here, I think that's a major contribution or a major line in, in Omar's book is how Nahda comes with its complexities and its layers of addressing modernity of, for example, the social clubs of the political discourses emerging at, at the time. The Nahda in Bahrain was showing the different direction or the different connections coming into Bahrain and going out of Bahrain was also reflecting the, the, the influence of all those discussions on, on, on the discourses within Bahrain regarding different themes. And Omar uses, uses the Nahda to counter ethnosectarianism as a framework of analysis for, for the history of Bahrain. Again, that's because the Nahda is showing us um, engagement that goes beyond nationalism and before nationalism that goes beyond sectarianism. And that's, that's again, that shows the richness of the political discourses at the time. Now, the, um, so if I want to summarize the, those connections, first, Nahda brings somehow this Arab world together. In, you know, I'm in, in one of the articles I published, I said, uh, we keep talking about the Arab, world, the Arab world, but how do we write the history of the Arab world? Is it about events occurring uh, you know, at the same time? That's not a comprehensive, or that's not an integral history of, of the region we call the Arab region. Nahda actually, provides a framework of analysis for this region in terms of how those ideas were moving from one place to another, were feeding into each other. And again, uh, uh, when we come to Bahrain in general and, and uh, Gulf studies in general, it's not a matter of receiving ideas. It's not, you know, they're not just at the receiving end. A deeper analysis of what's going on shows also contributions toward that. Because as I said, this becomes an integral uh, um, uh, approach to this history. Something, uh, as, as I was saying, to, to pay attention to, when we talk about the Gulf, we have to be very careful not to perceive it and study it as being on the receptive end of things. Uh, now, I know Omar's book addressed so many issues. The Nahda uh, was only uh, you know, a chapter in the book. But again, if we look deeper, as I said, uh, we're talking about connections. We're talking about ideas moving in and moving out and going in different uh, in different directions. Um, what else do I want to say about uh, Nahda? Omar, where, where's Omar? Hey, here, you're on un unmute. I need to talk to you. Yeah, I think uh, I think I can. Uh, you can hear me now. So the reason I want to hear you is to see, you know, if 
if we should talk about similarities between Zanzibar, because when we're talking about Zanzibar, we're also talking about Oman, right? And you know the the the, the connections between these two places in terms of the Nahda and Bahrain. So you know my, my intervention is about the place of the of the Gulf in in the Nahda, and I'm wondering, uh, knowing that you've read the book on Nahda in Oman and in Zanzibar. If you see similarities, you don't, you don't have to answer now. But for me, when I read your chapters on the Nahda more specifically, these are recurrent themes. The names change, but these are recurrent themes and concerns at the same time. So they're not random themes. The whole region is concerned about the same issues you discuss in your book. And at the same time, we see the emergence of uh, similar bodies. You talk about social clubs, for example. And social clubs emerge everywhere to discuss the Nahda or Nahda themes. I don't, you know, we have to be careful here. It's not that everything discussed within the, within the framework of the Nahda was perceived as the Nahda in particular. And that's, I think, why the Nahda was so comprehensive as a phenomenon in all those regions. It's those intellectuals, those activists, uh, journalists, whoever they are, they were talking about exactly the same issues and exactly the same themes, sometimes not knowing that they are borrowing the same language and the same issues from a network or from a network of newspapers or just, you know, a network of a certain network of correspondence. And I think here we have to be also careful in terms of not uh, thinking of the Nahda as something that was very determined, determined. The contours of the Nahda changed all the time, depending on the context. But again, the broad themes were the same. How do we approach modernity? Where do we place ourselves as Arabs within that modernity? What languages we use to address this modernity? And the Nahda was a lot about a new language emerging at the same time, new connections built. Uh, there was, you know, um, we can, you know, we keep placing Afghani and Rashid Rida and, and Muhammad Abdu kind of at the center, at the center of this Nahda. And it, I think it's about time to see, you know, once once the, the, the Nahda radiated as, as an engagement in certain themes in different parts of the world, how central those figures remained. Um, it's, I was rereading your chapter, Omar, um, and when you referred to them, it reminded me of when I referred to them at a certain point in my discussion of Nahda in Oman and Zanzibar. And then I felt that, you know, at some point I wanted to be more careful. We, we start with, they're kind of, you know, we look at them as those initiating that. I don't know how accurate we are when we place them in that context. Fair enough, I guess. But again, I don't know how relevant they remain to the whole story of the Nada with, with time in the way we refer, uh, we refer to them. If, it's net, if it means anything, it's, it's the, the, the richness of, of the themes, but also kind of uh, the entitlement that each locale had over the issues related to the Nada. I'm not keeping track of my time. Fadi, tell me when to stop, please. You're okay, Emma. We we, we okay. like we like it when you speak a lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I don't know what to you're, say. You're actually that. talking about a very important point relating to the to the book, which is how to situate intellectual history, uh, both uh, in in relation to the synchronic developments that were happening at the time, and also the the diachronic sequence that we see later on. And I think how to kind of balance them out is something that you're you're trying to grab. It, it has always been my concern that, we, um, you know, in, 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 my, um, in my article on the network as a methodology, I, I said the Arab world had different centers. And uh, because I was arguing against the Mashriki uh, center as the center of studying Arab history, especially, you know, in the context of Nada, let's say. And that has always been my worry, is that we take one center and we, we think that everything is radiating from one center, which happens in our historiography. It's really the Mashriqi center with Cairo being the major, you know, Beirut orbiting around Damascus, Baghdad. And um, 
my approach is to is to look at the multi centers. You know, yeah, maybe something in Cairo happened that related somewhere else, but a place like Bahrain, a place like Oman, for example, I, I don't, you know, something reached there but had its own flavor, had its own concerns. And it's perhaps better for us to start thinking about considering all of these places as centers by themselves and not really just kind of mini centers around a big center, which tends to be somehow the way we think about modern Arab history. And, um, and you know, Albert Horani is, is largely to blame here, but that's fine. And others, of course, and you can blame him for other things as well. But rereading the Nahda chapter, knowing that most likely I'll be asked to, to deal with this uh, issue, um, what I really, I, I read Omar's book last year and um, we hadn't yet initiated the deep discussion that we, we, we initiated Omar and I when we, when we met in Vancouver. Um, you know, it was seamless in a way that not that takes its place naturally in what was going on in Bahrain. And I think for me coming from a different center, as I said, I could see the similarities and um, and I think Omar can do more, or somebody else, on on those connections and what they what they meant, and you know how they. Um, I know you were in the book. You were concerned about you know countering ethno sectarianism, as I said, as the, as an as an, an analytical framework. But I think the way you treat not all the bits and pieces actually give us on the NATO uh, that they are rich by themselves can still take us in different directions. So I think that chapter by itself can be a seed for more work to be done. Uh, situating Bahrain in, in, a, in, in the region uh, or in the broader region. Um, and again, and maybe not looking at, at you know, just uh, the receptive end, but the connections between Bahrain and other centers within the Gulf, not just you know, in the Mashriq. Uh, we won't talk about Maghreb now, but that's uh, that's a different story altogether. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amal. Uh, and uh, now we're going to move from the Nahda to the realm of uh, political economy. And it's a great honor to introduce another distinguished uh, scholar and old friend, uh, who's uh, uh, Professor Adam Haniye. Uh, Adam is a reader in uh, development studies at uh, uh, SOAS, University of London. Uh, he, uh, he has an extensive uh, publication record on the political economy uh, of, the, of the Gulf. And his uh, latest book uh, was a fantastic, um, had a fantastic macro examination of the dynamics of the region. It was just published uh, uh, last year or two years ago, Adam, uh, with Cambridge. I think last 2018, year. 2018, yeah. 2018. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's very exciting uh, to be hosting uh, Adam and we're really uh, looking forward to, to your comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Abed, and, and uh, uh, thanks, Omar, and uh, everyone for uh, inviting me to be part of this. Uh, I, I want to also, actually, a lot of what I'm going to say is, is going to echo and I think resonate nicely with what Amal has just uh, uh, spoken to. Um, and I, I want to begin by saying I have very much the same uh, take, if you like, or, or uh critique of kind of Gulf studies um, and the way that uh, it was framed by Amal in the sense that I think very often when we think about the Gulf, we think about it uh, in separation or in isolation or exceptionally from the rest of the region. So a lot of my kind of research around political economy is trying to bring the Gulf's uh, uh, impact or connections with the re with the rest of the region um, really in into focus, uh, and I think this is uh, something that speaks a lot to to Amara's uh, uh, work. Um, and I, I want to uh, similarly, I think to Amara, my, my own interest in the Gulf uh, arose actually from uh, Palestine, um, and uh, you know. In the Gulf, but the story of the Gulf is often left out. Um, Adam, I think you froze for a second. So, oh, sorry. Uh, that Palestine for a second. Can you hear me now? 
I wonder if that's a, a <laughs> an external <laughs> big springs. <laughs> Is that okay? You can hear me now. Uh, we could hear you. Can you restart? From okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I was saying saying that uh, you know there's a, there's a a, a real uh, I have realization uh, living and working in. In, in Palestine, that so much of, of uh, Palestinian politics, Palestinian history uh, is bound up with the Gulf, uh, but we, we tend to kind of leave the story of the Gulf out um, of how we understand uh, processes in, in, in Palestine. I think that's true more, more, more uh, generally in, in the region. So um, I think that that's, that's I, I would echo uh, what Amal said in that in that regard. So I, I wanted to focus on three aspects uh, of of the book and ask Omar some questions uh, reflecting on these three aspects. Uh, the first is in relation to uh, the kind of the dominant paradigm uh, for understanding the Gulf, and you know many people have said this is the the main contribution of Middle East studies to to political science more generally, and that is of course the Rontia state. Um, uh, theory or Rontia state uh, approaches, of which, of course, there are many. Um, I uh, One of the things I really like about Omar's book is it, it problematizes and I think uh, uh, raises a whole set of um, critical uh, themes around Rontia, the Rontia approach. Um, in particular, kind of the, 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 the placing of oil centrally as the key explanator of societies uh, in, in in the Gulf. Um, I think what Omar does uh, so nicely is he disrupts this kind of sharp dichotomy between uh, the pre-oil and post-oil periods, um, uh, really looking at the relations that we see um, across the history, uh, the situating the Gulf in, in, in the wider kind of global dynamics, in particular, of course, British colonialism. Uh, and these kinds of uh, factors that get left out of the, 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 the dominant kind of frontier uh, way of understanding um, uh, the region. Uh, so uh, to me, you know, a lot of the ways that, that um, the kind of tropes around the Gulf, you know, the focus on uh, the ruling family or the focus on individual um, uh, uh, dynasties, uh, the focus on oil as kind of the key explanator, the whole kind of reading of a so-called Rontia mentality and, and, and that um, is really uh, challenged by um, uh, uh, what, what, uh, what Omar has done. Um, and I think another part of this is the, uh, and again, this speaks to something that Amal, po Amal pointed out, which is the, the kind of methodological nationalism um, that uh, typifies a lot of the way that uh, Middle East studies in general is approached. In other words, treating uh, the, the borders of the nation state um, as some kind of uh, 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 vehicle or, 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 or container of social relations um, uh, discreetly from the rest of the, the region and rest of the international system. And I think uh, looking at the kind of cross-border connections and seeing those cross-border connections as internal to um, the, the social relations of the, of the Gulf, uh, I think is really, really key and something again that, that comes out of, of, of the book. Um, so that's my first point is, is around, uh, you know, the, I, I would be interested in hearing uh, uh, connects partly to what, what I just said. Uh, you know, clearly one of the, the main critiques of, that, that Omar is raising here is this a, a critique around the ethno-sectarian uh, frameworks for understanding the Gulf and other societies in the region. Um, uh, and again, uh, I wanna, the, the first chapter I think does a really lovely job of uh, talking about how these categories of, of uh, ethnicity, of sect, uh, come into being, where they come from, how they get created, um, who are the actors involved, uh, and so forth. And it, it's it's really, to me, uh, uh, looking at the Gulf today, um, I often I, I think you know reading and reading the book, uh, there, there's a there's a lot of questions raised about the the contemporary processes around uh, citizenship and migration in particular, um, how the the category of of the of the citizen, how the category of the migrant um, get constructed, and how central these categories are today uh, to uh, uh, the the 
the political economy and, and broader social uh, uh, connections of the Gulf itself. Um, so this, this would be my, um, I guess my, my second question for Ahmad is, is, is how he sees, um, you know, some of the processes that were, were traced around ethno-sectarianism under British colonialism in uh, the contemporary moment uh, uh, in, in relation to the migrant citizen uh, divide. Um, uh, and I think uh, here, uh, again, to kind of de-exceptionalize the Gulf, uh, uh, it's interesting, I, I think, you know, there's, there's so many ways that we can point to the Gulf actually as being a laboratory uh, for uh, my, uh, the, the, the kind of governance of migration today. Um, you know, I'm thinking here, for example, about how in many Western societies, the UK, where I am at the moment, is, is a clear example of this, where uh, uh, citizenship uh, and, and citizens have been drawn into the governance of migrants um, in the sense that as a university uh, teacher, I'm expected to uh, uh, control uh, the migrant status of my students. Uh, who's, who's present? Are they really there? Um, uh, are they studying? Uh, doctors are being told to do the same thing. Uh, uh, rent, private rental, uh, private landlords are being do, uh, told to do the same thing about renting uh, to migrants and, and so forth, the, 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 the incorporation of citizens into the governance of, of migration, into the migration regime, that we do see really, I think, uh, as a feature of, of, of migration um, across many Western states, uh, uh, we, I, I think, is present uh, in the Gulf itself uh, for, for many, many years. Um, so in, in this sense, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I, I think uh, the Gulf actually is, is a laboratory for some of these, uh, these um, uh, uh, ways of regulating the migrant citizen um, uh, divide. Uh, and, in, and very importantly, I think incorporating citizenship citizens into um, into the state structures uh, uh, as 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 a part of this. So that that's my second kind of broad question to Ahmad is around this uh, migrant citizen um, uh, uh, division. And then the third uh, point is is a bit more general, uh, I guess, around the political uh, economy. And and Abid mentioned. Uh, the the you know the 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 issue of, of neoliberalism in in, uh, in 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 the region more broadly, um, I think Bahrain is a very interesting example because in many ways uh, uh, you know it's it's a kind of uh, as neoliberalism always is very uh, kind of particular or specific um, rolling out, but I, I think uh, it's interesting to look at the way that. Uh, economic reform, uh, Bahrain has actually been at the, the leading edge um, of, of this in, in, in much of the Gulf. Uh, uh, and I think in, I'm thinking to hear to some of Omar's uh, other work on kind of land um, ownership and, and the privatization of land uh, in, in Bahrain uh, as an example of this. Uh, um, so I, I guess uh, what I'm interested in perhaps asking Omar in this regard is how he sees the processes that he describes in the book around the making of um, ethno-sectarianism as connected also to the making of class um, in, in Bahrain and, and, and more broadly. Because again, one of the things that I, I really felt in, in reading uh, uh, Omar's book is the similarities uh, and uh, really productive ways that it made you th makes you think about some of the other contemporary debates we have about class today. For example, um, debates around how to understand the relationship between race and class. Um, uh, debates around intersectionality and gender and class. Uh, these kinds of themes um, that, again, are very often themes that are debated in, in Western contexts actually bear a, a lot of relevance to uh, uh, the, the Middle East and, and the Gulf. Um, and to me, what Omar is talking about, um, largely uh, around this notion of, of ethno-sectarianism and, and the kind of way that, that ethno sectarian is produced is is partly a story about how class itself gets produced um, and needing to understand class not as something as a pure economic category but also as a, as a category that's co-constituted with things such as um, the, the, the ethno sectarian uh, sectarian uh, uh, categories as well so it's it's this kind of um, I think way of reading theory uh, that is so nice uh, uh, and
And again, thank everyone for uh, for for being Adam, here today. I think, uh, uh, you, you froze at so nice, and I think you were tr you were saying something important. So can you oh, just us your concluding sentence? My concluding sentence was just simply to thank. Uh, to, <laughs> my concluding sentence was simply to thank Omar for uh, for writing the book and saying um, that it's it's a really uh, when you're reading it there are, there are all of these ways that uh, uh, you you can make broader kind of connections with theories and debates that are that that are uh, you know initially appear to be outside of the region but actually are very much internal to the region. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. And uh, I should add that, uh, uh, just as you said, yes, Bahrain is, the first, uh, is in many ways a, a pioneer in these so-called reforms that are currently taking place on the economic level. Uh, but it was also the first uh, site of the entry of uh, capitalism as we, uh, as we know it in the Gulf, uh, in many ways, these relations uh, developed there. And I think Omar uh, uh, does a great job of uh, integrating uh, these economic forces uh, uh, with uh, political analysis and social analysis uh, on the ground, showing that uh, uh, these kind of simple um, formulations that reduce and essentialize places like Bahrain into uh, the colonial categories like sectarian categories, for example, or ethno-nationalist categories, um, completely fail to take into account the complex material realities uh, that shape uh, spaces uh, like that and how they intersect with thought uh, and action on the ground. So thank you, Adam, very much for uh, your uh, important contribution. And uh, next, I'm very proud uh, to uh, introduce uh, my, uh, my friend, uh, Sultan Al-Amir, uh, who is currently a doctoral candidate in political science at George Washington University. Uh, somebody who's a very keen reader of the history uh, of the uh, Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf uh, region. Uh, so um, it's lovely to have you with us, Sultan, and uh, we look forward uh, uh, to your thoughts. Thank you, Abdurazak, and uh, thank you all for uh, having me here. I will uh, be brief and will build also on the previous comments by Amal and uh, Adam Hania. I will focus mainly on, on how Omar treated uh, the sectarianism in his book. And I think this contribution, its intuition is, is profound and it's important. And uh, uh, a welcome one in, 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 in the literature on Gulf studies. Um, normally as, normally when we uh, approach Bahrain and or it, when Bahrain is approached in in the studies of uh, nation, uh, of, of, of the Gulf or in the wider Arab region, it is mostly understood as a history of a conflict, a constant conflict between fixed uh, sectarian identities or, or sectarian groups. And that these groups normally are presented to be uh, 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 monolithic and uh, uh, defined in a clear cut boundaries between each other. And this uh, framework is, is fairly predominant in, 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 in the studies, not only in Bahrain, but also we have a spillover on, from these kind of frameworks to understand uh, political movements and political activities in, in Saudi Arabia and other countries in, in, in the Gulf as well. What Omar showed in, in his in his book, he emphasized that that the that the, the role of the imperial knowledge production in creating and fixing these sectarian categories and privileging them in understanding the region and makes other categories and structures such as class and kinship and uh, uh, political agencies and others uh, irrelevant or, uh, or to at least to be sidelined um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of understanding m m most important uh, moments and political uh, incidents in the history. That he and by doing this, 
by focusing on this ethnic, uh, what he calls the ethno-sectarian gaze, and by this imperial production of knowledge about sectarian groups and uh, sectarianism in Bahrain, uh, by exposing uh, the limits of these, uh, 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 this uh, 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 knowledge, he was able to account for moments and, and movements and activities that most that normally is uh, that normally are uh, sidelined and went unnoticed in in telling the story of uh, 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 the legacy of uh, anti-colonial and anti-sectarian. Uh, 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 political activism in Bahrain, it is either during the Nahwa moment or afterwards in in the fifties and the, and the sixties, and I found this uh, chapter on sectarianism and he's going after Lorimer and other uh, British officials in their. Uh, uh, understanding of the region very important, and I know I most and I uh, and, and when we teach uh, 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 the class on Middle East politics, I all I normally assign this chapter to my students, and I see how this uh, chapter changes how uh, uh, my students uh, view the, the the region. They come to the class with these uh, uh, pre uh, conceptions about fixed identities and age old conflicts in, in the Gulf. And uh, normally when they, when we, we reach this week about uh, uh, sectarianism, when we assign uh, Amr Shahabi's books, uh, 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 article, I, I notice how they start gaining this critical aspect and the critical uh, 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 lens on how to look into uh, the region and become, and these identities become Suddenly, historicized and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, imperial imposition in the in the region. <clears throat> I also encountered same um, same uh, challenge in understanding political activity, activities and political movements in Saudi Arabia uh, because the, the the because we have a different, slightly different version of this sectarian framework in understanding. Uh, 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 political activities in Saudi Arabia. Normally, Saudi Arabia is viewed as a as a as a, as a Wahhabi state who uh, 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 who uh, suppress its sectarian uh, identities, uh, uh, sectarian groups. And within it is only within this framework that Wahhabism versus other groups that movements and activities are understood in in Saudi Arabia. And by exclusively looking into uh, political activities in Saudi Arabia from this lens, uh, many uh, movements and uh, 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 activities went unnoticed. For example, there are uh, 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 an important labor movement that cross sect, sect and anti-imperial and anti-colonial in, in, in the 50s and 60s that was emanating from the West Eastern region and it uh, covers many regions in, 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 in the kingdom that normally be, it, it, until recently, that we 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 start noticing that people be, start paying attention to it, and I would conclude with uh, a quote from from uh, from uh, Omar's book, and I will follow it with a, a, a general question. And in in his uh, in, in the same chapter that I was talking about, he says that <clears throat> just like other forms of Orientalism, this ethno sectarian gaze although originally based on the colonial reading of the local situation on the ground, would increasingly morph and take on a life of its own, similar to an artist's impression of real life figures projected into a painting, where the two increasingly resemble one another only tangentially. <clears throat> Unlike the painting, however, such ethnosectarian outlooks would interact and feedback into, la into local events, generating real effects on the ground. And I would, I would uh, like from Omar to elaborate more on how this knowledge production transformed into itself to uh, a real effects on people's life and people's uh, lived uh, experiences in Bahrain and how um, 
these effects, either if, whether they are transformed into forms of uh, institutions or etc., how they could uh, perpetuate it themselves and uh, gain a, a, a continuity uh, through time. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sultan. And I think you've raised some essential angles uh, here, uh, especially about the uh, relationship between epistemology and what goes on on the ground. Um, that's a particularly uh, dear topic to me because when I look at the Gulf, but also when I look at the rest of the Arab world, uh, including Palestine and other parts, we see uh, this constant uh, so-called knowledge production project, which is actually should, the, the word knowledge, and it should be uh, really questioned here, that is led by uh, different currents uh, in both academia and the uh, policy circles um, who are invested in controlling and dominating the peoples of the region and its resources. Um, and then their frameworks get absorbed. Uh, so, for example, many of the ethno-sectarian uh, frameworks uh, uh, as well as the tribalist frameworks and other frameworks based on um, highlighting uh, social division and uh, segmentation uh, as the foremost uh, angle from which uh, to view society. And remember, social vision, uh, division and segmentation here is presented uh, along primordial, uh, primordialist lines. It's not like Marxist class analysis, for example, uh, which, uh, uh, which is uh, rooted in uh, this idea of materiality and the dynamic uh, relations emanating out of it. Uh, here we have this very rigid categorization of peoples and their relations. Uh, can everybody hear me, by the way? Yeah. Uh, we have this very rigid categorization of peoples and their social and political relations. And it's superimposed on the region. We have the Israeli school led by uh, uh, Joseph Kostner and his students, for example. They keep talking about tribalism, this tribalism, that you can introduce, you can understand the entirety of the region through reducing it to the tribe. You have the, uh, the British colonial classical school that uh, Omar so uh, uh, engagingly uh, uh, examines. Uh, and in great depth and detail. And he shows uh, through the uh, a micro uh, uh, cosm, that of, of Bahrain, uh, the, the a broader pattern here. Um, the colonial officials, the way they, they try to ossify uh, social relations into these categories so as to divide societies and control them. Of course, divisions uh, exist in any society, but the question is, uh, uh, how do we uh, account for these divisions uh, politically. And in the case of sect, as we know from uh, the work of uh, Sama Maqdisi and in, in, in the case of the, the Mashriq, and now the, the work of uh, Omar in the case of the Gulf, primordialist uh, approaches uh, simply do not account for reality accurately. And they mask as, uh, as knowledge, as absolute knowledge, uh, whereas in reality, they are an expression of a particular relationship of uh, domination. Unfortunately, in today's Western academia, but also uh, in uh, local Arab society, these uh, colonialist notions uh, are often reproduced, all often reproduced. Um, the interesting thing, when people study uh, other Western societies, for example, they, they, don't, they don't pull the same moves. Nobody would reduce uh, American political dynamics simply to a struggle between Protestants and Catholics, even though the, the division between Protestants and Catholics exists, and it's had political expressions. The political system there, however, was not necessarily uh, 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 built solely on that division, even though it features, you know. Um, so we have to uh, uh, think through this, uh, uh, this region in a more serious way. We have to take account of sectarianism, and this is what I, what I take from Omar's book, uh, without actually internalizing sectarian discourse. Uh, anyways, uh, we're going to now uh, move on to, uh, uh, and to uh, Saram Sefer. And she is uh, a PhD candidate uh, in the Comparative and International Development Education Program at the University of uh, Minnesota. Uh, she has a very exciting dissertation project, uh, which is uh, the exploration of the relationship between uh, nation-building processes 
and girls schooling uh, in the case of, uh, of Bahrain. Um, and it's because of this uh, uh, very uh, detailed knowledge that she acquired uh, the intersection uh, uh, between education, uh, politics, uh, and uh, Bahraini local society that we, we really wanted to hear from her today uh, about the book. Uh, and I look forward uh, to her uh, contribution. Please go ahead, uh, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdurazak. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, like you mentioned, I come to, um, to the space as a student of education where I study um, K through 12 schools as political institutions of nation building rooted in a longer temporality than the dominant social order. Um, I'll start my commentary today talking a little bit about my dissertation project, which um, in essence sort of like orients my engagement with the book, and then uh, share a, a couple of comments or thoughts that I have about how and why the theoretical, epistemological, and methodological contributions of contested modernity were particularly generative for my own thinking as I continue to grapple with my dissertation research. And then I'll end with um, three lingering curiosities that I have about the book, which perhaps can be ideas or suggestions for future projects. All right, so um, first, why am I here and what do I do? Um, drawing on archival research, policy analysis, and school-based ethnography, my research interrogates the relationship between girlhood, girls' schooling, and nation-building processes in the context of Bahrain. The project grew out of my own frustrations with dominant readings of waves of youth protests inside and outside of, school, outside of schools uh, within the context of the 2011 social and political unrest. Much of these enactments of political dissent was made sense of through um, an ancient hatred theory or what Dr. Amar conceptualizes as the colonial ethnosectarian gaze. I was particularly curious about the ways in which girls' enactment of political dissent, according, uh, so according to um, the BICI report, some of the most violent, violent quote-unquote, student-led protests happened in girls' intermediate schools and high schools. So girls' enactment of political dissent was essentially illegible and unintelligible, or how um, Sultan was describing, so just not noticeable. Um, so I began to wonder, under what conditions is the girl citizen subject afforded agency? Under what conditions does the girl become legible or noticed um, in relation to the nation's political imaginary? So my thinking around girls schooling and processes of nation building orients my engagement with contested modernity. My next point is about the epistemological and methodological contributions of contested modernity and how they have been particularly generative for my dissertation work. Um, grounded in an anti-colonial liberatory framework, contested modernity offers two important critiques that go hand in hand, um, and much of it has been alluded to um, in the commentaries of um, uh, my co-panelists. First, there's the uh, epistemological critique of colonial ways of knowing. So the questioning of the epistemic, epistemic validity of ethnosectarian assumptions that underlines the majority of historical and contemporary accounts of Bahrain um, or uh, politics and, politi and the political in Bahrain. Secondly, this epistemic critique in turn paves way for a methodological intervention. If we understand dominant readings of the political landscape as the product of a particular colonial ethnosectarian gaze, then it becomes necessary to also question the over-reliance on um, British archives that are essentially like a product of the colonial gaze, right? And, um, and then, and then um, it becomes like sensible to engage with other ways of knowing the self and the other, um, to explore and identify alternative archives that are indigenous to Bahrain. Methodologically, um, and this translated in the book to not necessarily eliminating our engagement with imperial archives, right? Because Dr. Amr, like you, Dr. Abdul Razak, in your work, Monsoon uh, Revolution, you both make a convincing argument that in order for us to understand the rise of absolute, absolute, absolutism in the Gulf and the histories of local uh, mobilization, we cannot read these histories separately from the histories of imperial Britain. 
a move that also speaks to Dr. Hania's um, uh, critique of the prevailing na nationalist um, methodology in, in Gulf studies and moving towards what Dr. Ghazal uh, describes as network as methodology to trace and examine the cross-regional connections. In my work, this meant that I also had to engage with the US Evangelical Missionary Archives being uh, essentially sort of like, you know, it is through their intervention that the project of um, the modern school um, uh, became a reality in, in, in Bahrain and, and then sort of spread out in the Gulf. Uh, in order to make sense of the story of schooling as part of this nation building project in Bahrain. So contested modernity's theoretical engagement, archival research and methodological approach all together take Bahrain and by extension the Gulf as a site of knowledge production, as opposed to a site of meet, mere data extraction. Um, so uh, to the comment that Dr. Um, Amr was, was saying earlier, like thinking of Bahrain as, as a center of in of itself, as opposed to a periphery to any sort of like other imagined centers. And I'm thinking here of my ethnographic work. So, um, for instance, like when I asked, um, uh, when asked uh, in, in in the space of the school, um, I asked one of my um, interviewees, a, a female, a 15-year-old female student. I asked her, like, why why is Bahrain not part of conversations that um, we engage with or they engage with in um, in their world history classrooms? She um, responded and said, well, nothing interesting happened in Bahrain. History didn't happen here. Um, so if anything, like this speaks to how important um, this, this intervention that contested modernity um, uh, offers not only to the, the scholarship, but also like it, it really matters in terms of like how we think about um, about the histories of, of these um, spaces and communities that we belong to in the Gulf. So contested modernity pushes against this idea of Gulf exceptionalism, the Gulf as a space void of politics and the political. Instead, um, it places Bahrain as a thread in a global tapestry of ideas, peoples, labor, commodities, and, and cultural practices in dynamic movement and circulation, both in relation to Arabic speaking um, peoples of, of the Levant and, um, and Egypt, as well as in relation to the Indian subcontinent which then also puts us like critical scholars of the Gulf in conversation with other anti-colonial scholars and activists in the um, loosely labeled uh, Global South. So in the remainder of my time, I'll quickly share a couple of um, lingering thoughts that I had, um, sort of like curiosities that I have about the book. Um, so my first and second points will speak to the discursive formation of the majority-minority dichotomy and the local and foreign foreigner dichotomy, which I think also was brought up um, uh, in previous uh, commentaries. So uh, first, um, one of the most resonating arguments for me in this book was the critique of the erased or misrepresented histories of Al-Nahda in Bahrain, a movement that was grounded in, quote, nationalist, transsectarian, anti-colonial tone having roots in an antithetical view of modernity to that of held by colonial Britain. The book makes an argument of how the discourse, uh, well, end quote there. <laughs> and then the book makes an argument of how the discourse of, Nah of a Nahda in Bahrain traces its roots to a Nahda Renaissance that uh, arose ac uh, across the Arab world in the latter part of the 19th century. So um, I think there's something really, really interesting happening here. This epistem epistemological tension in the dichotomy between al nahda modernity that was antithetical, quote unquote, to the British idea of, or colonial Britain uh, ideas of um, modernity. But then I read this sort of like antithetical as a, a flipping of a binary. So we go from the Sunni Shia binary to an to a Arabi non-Arabi binary. So rather than undo undoing the binary framework, which is how I understand the anti-colonial project to be um, sort of like moving towards, it's flipped. Um, and, and it makes me think about like Fanon's critique of like the need to imagine, imagine sort of like this. Uh, anti-colonial project beyond the European sort of like nation, nation state, state imagination. So that's kind of like something that I've been trying to like make sense of um, uh, by introducing uh, another framework that is um, predominantly 
based on like the centering of, of the Arabic identity. And then relatedly, my second point is about um, the local foreigner dichotomy. So, um, and I'm particularly interested in, in thinking about the Indian subject or the Hindu as they're referred to in the archives as like a foreigner. Um, that is like historically and always consistently a foreigner. Um, so um, in the beginning, so the book talks about like how the handful of Indians, um, I mean, using resources, of, of obviously in reference to archival sources, talks about like um, how a handful of Indians were, uh, this, there were a handful of Indians in, in, in the islands of Bahrain and therefore like that offer, offered, offered an opening for colonial Britain to claim sovereignty over their, sub, over their subjects, which then turned the subject into an, an inherently foreign subject and not local, right? And then, um, and then there are other ways in which, like this, um, the, this deep entanglement between the histories of, of the subcontinent and the histories of Bahrain. So you talk about like governance, um, uh, uh, and I, I pulled this quote from page twenty-seven about like how the political institutions um, that British uh, that the British would set up to rule the Gulf was were formally under the government of India, and that nearly all of its staff would have previous experience in the colonial rule in India. Um, and then also in terms of political mobilization. So, um, so you tell a story, this fascinating passage about how a member of the, the Bahraini um, Nahda figure, uh, Bahrain, a member of the, the Bahraini Nahda, and I believe it was Zayani, uh, was exiled in Bombay, and then um, and then his lawyer turned out to be. Um, uh, uh, Muhammad uh, Ali Jinnah, who was the founding father of Pakistan. And I remember reading that and my jaw dropped. Um, and you left me hanging because you, I didn't hear more about like, there. I didn't feel like there was space for us to like even imagine some sort of like, de um, you know, deep political sort of um, enmeshing between the imaginations of anti-colonial sort of movements in the subcontinent with the anti-colonial movements in Bahrain. I mean, obviously, you make a very important argument for how that those traces can be, uh, those um, sort of like political pro anti-colonial political projects find um, in terms of a Nahda uh, can be traced between Bahrain and, Mashruq, and the Mashruq, but I don't see that happening in relation to the Indian subcontinent. And I think I think that perhaps like warrants deeper engagement. Um, and I think the same can be said about um, entanglements between the Gulf and East Africa. Um, but I'm going I could talk more about that later, uh, but I, what I do want to what I do want to mention is the question of gender that um, Dr. Hania mentioned, and I think this is this is incredibly important, and and I think um, it's an it's a silence silence in the book that um, uh, left me feeling very agitated. So the only two representations of women in the entire book of um, colonial modernity were two particular characters, Sheikh Aisha bint Muhammad, the sister of Sheikh Ibrahim and the wife of Sheikh Isa bin Ali. And that's how the book um, identifies this subject. And then um, the ruler of Bahrain in the, in the early 19th century. And then the other representation was that of Noura, uh, a woman uh, divorcee living illegally with a male partner and then becoming a subject of um, judicial contestation between the British colonial uh, authorities and the ruler of Bahrain. So my critique of this is that um, it sort of like falls into what Radwa Ashur um, describes in her book, Likul um, al I don't know how you would, um, all oppressed have wings, um, is that she says like the, the representation of women in Arabic and in, in her work, Arabic literature, or Arabic writing. And I think it's true of, um, of um, the social sciences because I think of the social sciences as sort of like this art of storytelling. And um, it's is that this representation of women is reduced to her biological role. So this binary role of either a mahram, which is she says it's a mahram, either a mother, a sister, or a wife, or a ghania, which is a prostitute. And um, and I don't, you know, my hope is that future research can find ways to engage with women and girls as complex human beings in the same way that we think of we think of their male counterparts. And um, to do this, we really need to be creative in identifying um, archival collections. Um, and, and this is something that I've been grappling with in my own dissertation. It's not easy, but it's necessary. 
Um, so to reiterate, my question, um, my question then would be like, how do we reckon with like ethnic, racial, and gender differences within an ethno-nationalist project? I'm interested in thinking about how we can start engaging with these fraught histories. How can we ask questions, develop methodologies, construct archives, imagine futures where um, the disinherited, in the words of Fanon, continue to be at the center of our practice. As contested modernity shows us, the violences of colonial epistemology is a discursive stabilizing of social, political, cultural, and religious dynamics within essentialized territories and identities, which I also think that the nation state is a living embodiment of. And I'm thinking of like um, Spivak's uh, concept of epistemic violence. Um, if, you, if I may, I'll just end with, end with, with one, one thought that I really wanna share. Um, it's this, these processes of stabilization and containment are imperfect. They're processes filled with contradictions and slippages and excess. And I think it is in these slippages that radical reimaginations of belonging, of togetherness through a framework of relationality becomes conceivable. Um, it's through these like fissures and cracks that a Fanonian sort of internationalism as a political and theoretical intervention becomes a viable project. Contested modernity started this conversation for us, for me as a graduate student. I'm excited to see what's next. Thank you. Well, Sarah, um, based on this uh, uh, intervention, I'm sure you won't be a graduate student for long. I know that you're uh, gonna be defending your dissertation very soon. And I'm sure you're going to do an outstanding job because this was a beautiful intervention, a very thorough reading of the book, uh, a very fair reading of the book as well. Uh, I think you were uh, uh, tough but fair and absolutely uh, on point. Um, truly fantastic range of issues that you that you raise, uh, and I think it's especially important to uh, look at these uh, uh, various divisions from. Uh, angles uh, such as uh, the uh, angle of, of gender, because that also takes us away from the pro uh, away from the projects of power and domination that we see so intensely manifested in academic writing today, to projects of uh, liberation and imagining uh, different futures. Um, and I really think that the, there is, there is a, uh, we have an important role as scholars in, in doing so. I know that you're trying to pursue that uh, very actively in your dissertation, especially uh, when you're dealing with a subject like uh, girls' education that is so, uh, that is so important. Uh, but I know that that is one of the things that I really admired in Omar's book. I mean, it came out of a very specific moment, uh, the moment uh, in which it arrived is, is a moment where Bahrain, at the moment is completely divided along social lines. The political project of division has actually manifested itself socially now. Uh, these sectarian identities that Omar uh, has traced uh, so effectively, their lineage, you know, now have assumed a lived reality. And some people even uh, now try, and I've heard this in many, on many different occasions, some people have actually so internalized it that they think uh, that they're true. And they've, uh, they're revising entire histories on, the, on their basis. I mean, I hear statements like, oh, the, uh, you know, uh, the Shias are so-and-so, the Sunnis are so-and-so. There's attempts to um, completely uh, marginalize the Shia in, in Bahraini history. There's attempts to de-indigenize the Sunnis in Bahraini history. There's attempts to uh, uh, entangle the two in a state of constant conflict. And it's unspoken often in academia because it's hard to talk about these things. Uh, it's very hard to talk about these things um, without being accused of uh, being a partisan of one party to the, uh, or, the, or the other. Not just in Bahrain, but also today across the Arab world. We see this in Iraq. We see this in Syria. We see this in Lebanon. We've seen this in Lebanon for, for decades. But the responsibility of scholars is to look at how these constructions debilitate and prevent us from imagining a different future, a future uh, of equal citizenship, uh, a future of uh, uh, liberation from patriarchy, of liberation from uh, uh, the cap uh, capitalist control, of liberation from uh, what Omar uh, has uh, correctly described uh, as, a, uh, as a system of absolutism that had its origins 
uh, in a process of divided rule imposed by the by the British. And I think, by the way, I hope somebody will address the divided rule that dynamic. Maybe uh, we'll have that with our uh, um, last and truly wonderful speaker, who is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Wafa Sayed. Uh, Dr. Wafa is uh, currently a postdoctoral uh, uh, researcher. Uh, at uh, the Gulf University of Science and Technology, GUST, uh, in Kuwait. Uh, she completed her uh, PhD at the London School of Economics. Uh, I had the, the, the special honor of reading that amazing uh, piece of scholarly research. Um, one of the things that is so beautiful about it, and uh, is, is I know we're talking about Omar's work today, but I wanted to, to, to just mention this for a second about Wafa. Uh, she manages to root uh, the uh, uh, foreign policies of uh, uh, Kuwait and Bahrain in uh, the social dynamics of these countries, which is a, a really beautiful uh, thing to do, especially within IR. It's rare to find uh, uh, people do, uh, doing uh, such a beautiful job uh, in rooting and connecting the social uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the political and with uh, the foreign policy aspect. So I'm really proud to be hosting uh, Wafa. Wafa, of course, uh, like Sarah, is from Bahrain and uh, knows the dynamics there very well. She was a keen reader of this book, and I look forward to her comments. Please go ahead, Wafa. Thank you, Dr. Abdurazag. You're much too kind um, in your description of my work. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank the Arab American Educational Foundation Center for Arab Studies for having me today. Thanks to you, Dr. Abdurazag Takriti and Fadi Qafaiti for organizing this roundtable. I am happy to be here today to discuss uh, Dr. Amr Shahabi's book while also reflecting on the state of Gulf studies and Middle East studies more generally. In my opinion, one of the most important contributions that Umar's book, Contested Modernity, has to offer is its utilization of a wide range of locally authored Arabic sources. This sets it apart from much of the previous literature on Bahrain and the Gulf, which relies exclusively on British archives. What Umar does particularly well is that he not only uses these local sources, but he also contextualizes them historically and compares them to the colonial archives, which are not treated merely as a source of information, but are also viewed critically. Local sources should thus not be treated as an afterthought, but should also be incorporated and centered in any research project on the region, subjected to critical analysis and used to counterbalance Western and colonial archives. The inclusion of local sources also allows for the investigation of a variety of previously hidden viewpoints, points, which makes possible the reading of archives against the grain. Umar retells Bahraini history in the first two decades of the 20th century through the centering of Bahraini historiography. He uses the writings by local historians such as Nasr al-Khairi's Qala al-Nahrain fi Tariq al-Bahrain. Khairi was one of the first modern Bahraini historians, and he wrote this manuscript on the history of Bahrain in the first two decades uh, of the 20th century. Umar also uses Muhammad Ali Tajir's Uqd al-La'al fi Tariq Awal, written in the same period by another of Bahrain's pioneer modern historians. There is also Tuhfa Nabhaniya by Muhammad Nabhani, who was the first modern historian of the ruling family. And in addition to these local sources, Umar also uses other Arabic sources that include Amin al Raihani's Muluk al Arab, uh, Hafid Wahba's Khamsun uh, Aman fi Jazirat al Arab. These bring to the discussion a regional viewpoint that can be used to compare with the local and British sources. Additionally, what is particularly significant about these Arabic sources, with the exception of Wahhab's book, is that they are contemporary to the British archives and the period Umar is discussing in his book, which allows for a more nuanced comparison. When I first read Umar's book, uh, I could not help but draw connections to my own research and my methodological and the methodological struggles I encountered while writing my PhD. I wrote my thesis in international relations, as Dr. Abdel Razak just mentioned, which is a discipline that often does not encourage the use of archives, let alone local sources uh, that to some in the field may seem a bit unconventional. My research traces the historical and ideational origins of foreign policy making in the Gulf states through investigating a diverse set of primary and secondary sources. I did use the colonial archives, which are indispensable to the study of the region. However, I was not able to tell the full story without looking at local sources, including cultural texts such as textbooks, newspapers, and magazines. I treated these sources as an archive, even though to some they are not archives in the literal sense of the word. 
So why are colonial or Western archives not enough when studying, when studying the Arab world and particularly the Gulf region? These archives mainly reflect the perspectives of colonial and foreign agents. They tell us how they perceive the situation on the ground and how they interpreted the various events and encounters they had with locals. Therefore, researchers often miss certain things or end up with a skewed version of events. They miss certain things like a nahda, uh, in the case of Bahrain, uh, as Dr. Omar uh, rightly shows. Uh, filtered, these skewed versions of events can also be filtered, they, they end up being filtered through a prism of an outsider with particular biases and agendas. While this may sound self-evident to some, um, Within the field of Gulf studies, these sources are too often treated as objective reality. Umar's book, for example, shows how ethno-sectarian categories that are taken for granted in much of the academic literature on Bahrain were in significant ways institutionalized and politicized by Bahrain by British colonial policy. My research seeks to understand the perspective of the foreign policy decision maker. If I had relied entirely on British archives, I would only be able to understand how British officials viewed members of the political elite and how these elites represented themselves to the British. But this only gives me part of the story. Local sources can then fill the gaps in the picture. In my case, they were instrumental in understanding how members of the political elite represented themselves to their societies, which was often different to how they represented themselves to the British. At the same time, local sources enabled me to unpack the state and its multifaceted actors and analyze their relationship with societal factions. The do dominant trend in international relations continues to downplay domestic dynamics, ignoring the impact of state society relations on foreign policy. I believe that this issue with the discipline is amplified when it comes to the Gulf states, which the international relations literature treats as black boxes with no internal politics or civil societies. There is often a discussion in Gulf study circles um, about how this region remains the last bastion of Orientalism. I would argue that out of all the academic disciplines, it is in the international relations, with, relations of the Gulf where I find Orientalist conventions to be the most tenacious. I should state that using local sources is not always easy, given the, that official archives in the Gulf are frequently inaccessible or even non-existent. Researchers might th must thus find alternatives. Key among these are local magazines and newspapers which offer useful insights into societal trends. These sources include interviews, speeches, op-eds, letters to the editor, as well as works of poetry and fiction. In particular, the Bahraini and the Kuwaiti press of the 1950s, a time when press laws were less restrictive, include rich and frank discussions that are often absent in later periods. These periodicals allowed me to encounter, uh, to uncover the issues that dominated the discussions of the educated class and investigate how the social segment viewed the government. They also allowed me to see how members of the government represented themselves to society. One of the magazines that I used was Sot al-Bahrain, which was published in the 1950s by a group of Bahraini intellectuals who promoted a modernist Arab Islam Islamic and anti-colonial agenda. This magazine became a launching pad for future nationalist activism in Bahrain. Scrutinizing sources like Sot al-Bahrain, along with other press from the same period, such as Al-Qafila and Al-Watan, allowed me to identify popular discourse in Bahrain in the pre-independence period, which was instrumental to understanding state-society relations and ultimately their impact on foreign policy following independence. The lack of official archives also necessitates more cre creative and flexible approaches to research. For example, I found school textbooks, particularly history textbooks, to be useful in investigating official historical narratives. I detected changes in these narratives depending on how certain Gulf states wanted to represent themselves to the public or position themselves regionally. In the age of social media, we as researchers also have the chance to learn about the personal collections and family archives that some are publicizing now on Instagram and Twitter. In fact, some of the most interesting sources I found was through utilizing these tools. These are just brief examples of how we as researchers can be imaginative in our search for local sources, um, even if our research is in a discipline like international relations, which I'm in, in which such sources are not widely seen as valuable. There's a lot of material available to us as Umar's book uh, rightly shows. For example, there's also many sources in Farsi that are waiting to be explored and some rising scholars have done some great work on this like Dr. Lindsay Stevenson. 
At the same time, we must also engage with Arabic writings uh, and academics, uh, not only as primary sources, but also in a way that bridges the gap between Gulf scholarship in the West and what is written locally and regionally. Though this may seem challenging at times, I believe it is vital to bringing in a local and more balanced perspective to our research. Um, thank you very much for having me and I look forward to the discussion that will follow. Well, what's, what's so great about your comments, uh, Wafa, is that you're not just uh, announcing an agenda, but you're actually practicing it uh, through uh, what you've written in, in your dissertation. Uh, and I know that, uh, uh, that uh, Omar's book uh, also um, is an important milestone in doing so uh, in relation to Bahrain in particular and the uh, Gulf in, in general. Um, and I think the question of sources uh, is usually uh, one of the excuses that is used by colonialists and orientalists to uh, pursue uh, their uh, ethno-sectarian uh, agendas. Uh, because they, they, they either uh, claim that there are no local sources, or uh, they claim that uh, any usage of the colonial record, uh, this is the new, by the way, fashion, uh, is, is to say uh, uh, anybody using the colonial record uh, is, uh, uh, is excluding native agency and so on. Okay, um, even though actually we have to, as uh, people uh, uh, who are colonized, uh, who are still uh, feeling the effects of uh, external control in this part of the world. Uh, and really we have to be very transparent about this. Knowledge is implicated in relations of power. The current relations of power in the region uh, are very much colonial relations of power in, in new forms. Okay, not the traditional colonialism of the past, but in new forms. So when we look at something like the colonial record, we have a responsibility to look at the colonial record. Okay, um, and we have to, uh, a responsibility to look at the colonial record critically as scholars coming from this part of the world. We have a responsibility to our people uh, because they need to know the story of what happened to them. They need to know the story of how they were dominated, how they were controlled and how indeed uh, there was an entire project at dividing uh, uh, them and at uh, augmenting pre-existing uh, uh, social divisions and utilizing them uh, towards uh, uh, the ends of control uh, and uh, domination. So um, this is the only way uh, through which we can start uh, a project uh, of uh, liberationist scholarship uh, to engage in uh, what uh, Robin Kelly calls uh, freedom dreams. Okay, we have to we have to dream of a freedom in scholarship. That is a legitimate pursuit. And understanding the world we live in allows us uh, to uh, initiate that process. Now, um, Omar, uh, we're gonna open the space uh, for Dr. Shehabi uh, to um, engage with some of the uh, comments and to tell us a little bit about his own book and then we will uh, take some questions and answers for him. Uh, so, uh, and for the rest of the uh, panelists here. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Shahabi, of course, uh, uh, you know, is the author of this wonderful book, Contested Modernity, that we're discussing today, but he also happens to be uh, the director uh, of the Center for Gulf Development Studies. He, he was the founding director of that center, uh, and really, uh, I should uh, uh, say a couple of things about that wonderful initiative that he started about a decade ago now. Uh, it's pretty much uh, uh, the major independent uh, center for the study of the Gulf uh, in the region. It's created a space uh, for a very large number of young uh, emerging voices from the region as well as established critical uh, voices. It's been, a, a, it's had an annual meeting uh, that brings together uh, very critical uh, uh, scholars from across the board. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to participate in one of the sessions. It's amazing, uh, incredible space. Uh, because it's a free space um, in a region so awash with uh, uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, with money, basically regime money. <laughs> you 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 have so many uh, centers that just parrot what the state wants to say, and in a, re a regime a region uh, that is so uh, uh, controlled by external also forces and agendas and consulting companies and so on. You find all the, these kind of uh, public policy centers that are not concerned with the future 
uh, of the people there or with their social struggles, uh, but are more concerned with uh, learning more uh, about um, how to continue facilitating uh, capitalist and new imperial relations uh, uh, existing there. Um, so you, to have a center like that is so refreshing. And Omar really played the key role in doing that. And, and by doing so, uh, he, he provided an epistemological service to this part of the world. Uh, so uh, besides his directorship of that center, he's currently uh, a visiting associate professor uh, in sociology at the uh, University of British Columbia. Uh, and uh, he is really a truly prolific author. He's written so much in, in, in Arabic. Uh, and now uh, we are reading his first book in English. And I know for sure that this is not his last book in English as well. So Omar, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, to begin with, I would like to acknowledge that this presentation is being conducted on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsulil Watuth nations. Um, and also, I would like to, in the beginning, uh, thank you to the Arab American Educational Foundation Center for Arab Studies for organizing this. And thank you very much, Abed, and also Vadi for organizing. And uh, thank you, really, Amel, Adam, Wafa, Sarah, and Sultan uh, for, for the presentations and engaging and for all the people who have attended today. Um, so I think what I'm going to focus on is that I'm trying to integrate it all together is uh, maybe give a bit of a background of what were the motivations that made me uh, write this book and the positionalities with it, and then integrate all the wonderful and uh, engaging comments that came while I do this. So how the, uh, uh, a background on how this book emerged and uh, how I came to approach it, really, where there were three motivating factors. One came while I was working on another book project in Arabic on the political economy of the Gulf Arab states in the oil era uh, called Tasdir al-Tharwa wa Ghtirab al-Insan. And I found myself while writing this book having to come back to the pre-oil period, uh, alluding to what Adam said, and particularly this conjuncture of the first quarter of the 20th century uh, to understand the emergence of several uh, main social relations. And sp uh, particularly, I found myself coming back to Bahrain to understand them. So I found I had to come back to this period and specifically to Bahrain to understand the rise of the system of modernized absolutism uh, we know today that Abdel Razak has covered in his work uh, as well. Also to understand the rise of uh, direct uh, colonialism and Western uh, presence in the region with Corzon's forward policy, and also to understand the emergence of new legal bureaucratic complexes that we know today. So the citizen foreigner, for example, legal bureaucratic complex, uh, the kafala system, which I've covered as well uh, in other work, and the labor migration system. So all of these, when I was trying to trace uh, their, uh, their history, I found myself coming back to this period. Now, the second strand also was when I was working on uh, political movements in Bahrain in the 1960s and 1970s, and particularly the, the nationalist and leftist movements in that period, which was actually what I um, uh, wrote on to begin with and uh, initiated my interest, at least in writing in Bahrain. And uh, usually what is emphasized when looking at these regions is uh, oh, these movements, and I see we have some wonderful people who were also present in these movements, like uh, Abdel Nabil Akri uh, here with us. Uh, so that, that's amazing to see. Um, usually what's emphasized is the, uh, the, um, the Arab influence and the regional influence, uh, that, which obviously played a big part in it, in Nasserism and the leftist turn, etc. But also I, I found when I talked to a lot of the people that they built on also local traditions and concepts and thoughts that also needed to be emphasized. And I found myself going back in time as uh, to look at these traditions. So I had to find, uh, looking at the genealogies of these movements, I'd have to go back to the 50s and look at the movements there and even earlier to the early 20th century uh, to, look, to understand how these traditions and local genealogies were built over time for these movements. Uh, and even sometimes family lineages, direct family lineages where you have three generations of people who were involved from the early 20th century up until the 1970s and even uh, today. 
So this is uh, so this is what brought me to one of these. This is not the only one, but to one of these is uh, to look at al Nahda, uh, what is usually described as al Nahda uh, figures in the early 20th century in Bahrain and the late 19th century. So this also uh, and this this actually period about al Nahda uh, in Bahrain and the figures that came has been completely neglected in the English literature. Uh, there has been amazing work done on. Uh, uh, on other places in the Gulf, uh, Amal Ghazal, obviously, on, uh, on Oman and Zanjibar, on Kuwait. Now we also have uh, uh, Talal Rashud and Abdul Rahman Ibrahim working on them as well. Uh, and so, but in Bahrain, there was, in fact, it was kind of completely erased in the, uh, in the discussion. So this made me think, okay, this also is a very important part that, uh, that I wanted personally even to understand because of uh, I was under, you know, uh, interested in understanding the different genealogies uh, and traditions of political movements in Bahrain leading up to the nationalist and leftist movements and afterwards. Um, and then this, re this time as well, the first quarter of the se first century uh, in Bahrain, uh, or at least this is what I argue, was the also saw the rise of uh, the intensification of political mobilization based explicitly on uh, sects, on defined ethnic, uh, ethnicities and sects, which culminate in the clashes of the early 1920s. Uh, now, these mobilizations and clashes took, as Osama Magdisi uh, shows in his work on 19th century Le uh, Lebanon, almost kind of a secular form. Religious clerics or, uh, or let's say, uh, religious doctrinal ideas took a marginal role here. It was actually more different mobilizing groups that were, in fact, in a lot of cases, led by notables who were also merchants at the same time. Um, and other factors, obviously, but that, it, yeah, so that this emergence also needed uh, explanation, which will bring me to the final motivational force, uh, which is that this period, when covered in the English literature, is usually almost exclusively reliant on the colonial archives. Uh, it uses it's um, and it's not only I mean there's no problem with using the colonial archives, but relying exclusively on it obviously is uh, something that needs to be interrogated. But also the use of the similar terminology, uh, similar epistemic categories, narratives of you know Sunnis versus Shia or big blocks of ethnicities in fights since uh, centuries before, um, and also that this period. Of the, 1920, of the first few years of the 1920s is usually taken to reflect the history of Bahrain before that and after it. That basically it becomes kind of somehow reified that usually if people want to say, oh, if you want to understand Bahrain's history, this is it, and take a look at these years and rather than looking at them uh, within their context and periodize them and, and historicize them, they're seen as, yeah, this is basically a reflection of how we should read all of history. And if, in fact, it becomes usually a point where people sometimes jump in history. They're like, oh, yeah, this happened in the 1920s. Let's then jump to independence and let's then jump to 2011, for example. So, um, so this was the third motivation, uh, looking at the imprints of colonial knowledge, structures, institutions, and actions on both academic works in Bahrain and society more ge uh, generally, and how these interacted with uh, on the ground with local factors, which also need to be recognized and looked at uh, together. And within this, look at the epistemic categories that have been, that emerged and the institutions and structures that propagate them, whether in academic writing or wider. Uh, and so the book emerged as a look at the entanglements of forces at this critical juncture of the early 20th, 20th century where you had in this period what's called the also the rise of the age of capital. Obviously, Bahrain was also booming in this period from the pearl uh, industry. Also, the rise of direct colonial intervention, the rise of al-Nahda, the rise of ethno-sectarian political mobilization, the rise of modernized absolutism and its bureaucracy, the rise of citizen-foreigner dynamics and categories, and... Uh, all of these kind of, uh, uh, also, as I mentioned, the kafala system that I uh, talked about later and general uh, 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 labor market dynamics that cross borders. And so basically attempting to tell the story of these different contestations and shapes at angles that took form in Bahrain and the, you know, quote unquote, modernity 
in this period. Um, so, you know, many of these issues, absolutism, colonialism, relations of coercion, the politicization of sex, are suffice to say not easy to write about. Uh, repression and censure, particularly those from and living in the region, uh, obviously is a big issue. But also this period also has contested narratives and evokes heated debates and emotion within Bahrain, within different sides, uh, particularly the events of the early 1920s. And usually the discussions, you know, also take the shape of, you know, who was wrong and who was right, and also take the shape of based on ethnicities and uh, uh, sects. And this has per uh, particularly become acute since 2011, uh, where issues have, uh, and maybe even earlier, maybe since the early 2000s with wider regional events such as the Iraq War, etc., where issues of sex and ethnicity have become particularly salient uh, and which could be, uh, give a tendency to read all of history through a similar lens. Um, so, you know, this, especially when it's someone from Bahrain <laughs> and, you know, trying to, you know, maybe present something that does not conform to the usual narratives out there, uh, makes it a particularly uh, difficult topic to grapple with and, and write about. But I thought this is all the more important and particularly important to, you know, because what I wanted to try to do in this book is, you know, try to move beyond, you know, which side was right or which was wrong and more to analyze why such different forms of political mobilization uh, emerged and under what conditions and in conjunction with all the other rise of the other phenomenons that I mentioned previously. Um, so, you know, as Wafa mentioned in the English literature, the, the reliance has been exclusively uh, on British colonial sources, uh, at least in this period. Uh, luckily, there are, uh, with some exceptions here and there. Uh, luckily, uh, now, as Wafa mentioned, there's also an embarrassment of new sources out there that look at 19th century Bahrain and early 20th century, uh, which, you know, uh, so in many ways, actually, this book was in a way, also a homage to local sources that are local, uh, usually uh, ignored and local uh, like people and uh, uh, writers and historians and uh, academics from Bahrain who also write, but are also usually, unfortunately, completely ignored uh, within the uh, within uh, English writings. Um, and, you know, which I write, uh, which I, you know, rely on ex uh, extensively. Uh, you know, the work of people like Nader Kazim, Wissam al Sibir, Bashar al Hadi, May al Khalifa, Jasim al Abbas, Fuziya Matar, Isa Amin, Muhammad al Salman, and, and many, many others. I mean, I, I won't do justice uh, to everyone uh, writing on this period here uh, that I've, you know, relied on extensively in, in, in writing this book and also now in the Arabic translation, uh, which has uh, come out. Now, um, this. Uh, I am very, you know, because of this work and uh, the uh, uh, the material it covers, it, it for sure is, is it, as, uh, as Sarah said, it's the beginning of hopefully uh, more on it. And it definitely has gaps, uh, which I'm very uh, uh, aware of. And even in the Arabic translation that I've come out that I think we also have the uh, uh, the translator here with us, uh, Dr. Hamad Reyes, which I just wanted to say hi. And uh, maybe in another... Uh, uh, sitting or meeting, we could also discuss that because it was actually a very interesting exercise, the whole translation going back and forth with it and the choosing of terms and how does one translate a book which in many ways was written for an audience in English within certain discourses and within certain ways of looking at things when you're now looking at uh, translating it into Arabic where usually the discourse obviously and the, even the epistemic categories used are quite different. And so how does this translation work out? Maybe we can uh, talk about this uh, uh, in a different, um, in, in a different uh, uh, setting. Um, so yeah, the, Ar so the Arabic translation ended up being expanded by about 15 to 20,000 words by, uh, of adding new material uh, to it. Um, and as mentioned uh, by, by Sarah, definitely there are uh, uh, things that were not emphasized, which should have been emphasized more, and finding ways of dealing. One is the issue of uh, uh, of gender, uh, which, again, 
just to add a couple of more things that I, um, I, I did not explore fully, but I think are much more uh, worth exploring. One is obviously the, um, uh, which I mentioned, you know, but not in, in much in depth, is also the issue of, uh, of education and how it ties with gender. Because what's interesting is in, in Bahrain, actually, uh, the first school was a, was a, uh, was a girls' school. So actually, uh, female education was the first education to start in Bahrain, um, which obviously was the missionary school, um, which also this definitely, I think uh, through her work, she probably explores much more the, uh, the history of this and the, uh, um, the ramifications of it. Another that I also uh, explored a bit, and I do more in the Arabic version, but still it's not enough, and I think it needs much more, is the use of... Um, oral traditions and, and, and songs, really, or, uh, that were uh, sung. So the one I used was the one uh, which uh, pearl divers sang, uh, uh, the families of pearl divers sang to their families coming back. And usually, obviously, the, um, the families who were waiting for the pearl divers were uh, uh, women or, or children. And so the, the stories uh, and the, uh, actually the composers of the, of the songs usually were also women and there are the ones who are you know pass them down through the families now so i think uh, the stories also that can one can look at in these songs and these different oral traditions would be very interesting i know that some people are doing some work on this like uh, uh, i think marwal kohiji is doing some amazing work on uh, on, on on pearl diver or uh, let's say songs of families of pearl divers who go uh, uh, away and also uh, basically songs uh, also generally that look at like uh, social life uh, within this. Um, so, yeah, so definitely the book focuses on certain things, uh, as is the case, I guess, uh, that one has to do in a book on certain issues more than others. And probably the ones that get the most uh, attention in the book are Al-Nahva, uh, for the reasons uh, that I'm going to mention, colonialism and the political economy of the social relations in Bahrain in the 19th century and the 20th century. Uh, so, just give me one second because my battery is running out. So let me quickly plug in my uh, charger before it runs out. One second. Dr. Uh, Shahabi, we're going to now uh, utilize a second to uh, field some questions. And uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, we will we have two questions that uh, uh i'm back uh, okay. okay we have a can i continue we'll, uh, <laughs> just to we'll, uh, we'll, we're done we're gonna take some questions now amar and you can ah. uh, you can address uh, some of the issues uh while we take the the, the question so um we have a, a question from uh hasna mukhtar uh Basically, uh, it's, uh, she says, uh, Fadi, uh, can we actually invite uh, uh, Hasna to ask her question in person? Uh, Hasna uh, left the uh, chat. Hasna, I mean, oh, left the meeting. Left the chat. Yeah. Okay. So her question was, as a Saudi researcher of uh, gender-based violence in the Arab Gulf, I, I felt less crazy about the hegemony of the white male colonial gaze and the majority of the English literature about the region when I read Omar Shahabi's book. It gets so exhausting to push back against the colonial gaze on one hand and patriarchy on the other hand, put simplistically both in the local and global spheres. My question uh, slash plea, can we please have this become a collective or an ongoing movement allowing for further discussion and collaboration? Uh, because for doctoral students like myself in academia, uh, we are in desperate need for such spaces and support. Um, so that's one question, Omar. Uh, another question, and perhaps other panelists uh, would like to also, if any other panelists wish, wishes to engage with that question, uh, please go ahead. We have a second question from Jasim uh, Hussein. I wonder if the arrival of the Arab Spring benefited or adversely affected the cause of modernity in Bahrain. Uh, and Jasim also has a, a third question, uh, which is... Uh, uh, you know, it sounds like, by the way, Jasim's questions sound really easy and light. Uh, thank you, Jasim, <laughs> for asking these questions. The third question is, concerning um, the pandemic, I noticed uh, the emergence of hate messages against expatriates at a time when the government was showing generosity for all. Any reading? 
question mark. So let's start with these uh, questions from Hasna uh, uh, Mukhtar and Jasim Hussein, and then we can uh, uh, continue. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I'll try it because also I, I'm very cognizant that I did not address some of the questions yet that the panelists asked. So I'll try to integrate them, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, together. But I think also on Hasna's point is I... Um, no, I mean, I think that's, uh, I agree completely. I mean, I hope that like, um, you know, we are, we all can be part of a conversation of how to uh, reread and reapproach and maybe reconstruct Gulf studies in a way that, um, that addresses uh, uh, some of these issues that like, you know, and uh, at least what I tried, what I tried in my work is to try to contribute to new critical works uh, emerging on the Gulf, many of them by great individuals here uh, that try and attempt to explore previously uh, hidden histories that take seriously the colonial imprint and how it interacted with, with on the ground with local factors that emphasizes as well the importance of reading the colonial, colonial archive against the great and critically unpacking the epistemic categories that uh, emerge uh, from this that takes seriously local traditions themselves of political movements and mobilizations and how they have developed while also linking them to wider networks, whether regionally uh, or globally. That places the Gulf within the political economy, for example, of the Indian Ocean during the 19th century, but also explores and emphasizes the strong linkages in terms of people, thought and mobilization across the Gulf and the wider Arab world and the emergence of thoughts of movements based on Arabism, Islamism, educational reform, political reform, uh, not only because of ideas imported from abroad, but also based on local traditions themselves. Uh, work that explores the entanglements across borders and indeed the emergence of these borders and categories like local, foreigner, uh, etc. Work that explores the social relations in which uh, overt ethno-sectarian mobilization intensifies at certain critical conjunctures rather than pausing it, it as a continuous centuries long battle. Uh, you know, work that hopefully also traces the emergence of modern bureaucratic structures and modern rule, whether absolutism or the kafala system uh, in concrete developments on the ground rather than just positing them as you know, ancient time immemorial customs. Um, and, you know, the exciting part is that these conversations are hopefully in their beginning and, uh, and hopefully can be developed on more. So maybe if you'll allow me, even if I can get, just get five minutes to talk about a couple of these, I think, that uh, also talk about the different uh, uh, things that, that were mentioned. Um, I, would, I would say two, two minutes, Omar, because we have so many questions. Uh, right. so okay, Halas. Let's do a. What, I, for, I just wanted to mention that one of the reasons I wanted I I was interested in focusing in on on Al Nahva is because of uh, looking at the. I was uh, interested in looking at the emergence uh, or the genealogy of you know terms and concepts such as you know uh, political reform, separation of powers, anti-colonialism, uh, educational modern educational reform. Etc. All of these different kind of uh, concepts and ideas that were coming up, and as uh, Emil mentioned, I think it's important to explore these within the uh, uh, wider uh, regional networks that were emerging. And also, as Sarah mentioned, so for example, I try to expand a bit on the connection with uh, Muhammad Ali Janah uh, in uh, and uh, basically in India, because even the name of one of the groups that emerged, uh, which was called the Bahraini National Congress. You can even see the similarities with the name, with the Indian National Congress, uh, and how they basically even some of the uh, concepts and uh, uh, and terminologies used were. So that's definitely an interesting connection that I hope others and uh, you know that should be explored more. There's a connection between Bombay and and uh, and uh, other places, or even with Iraq. So one more that I uh, try to explore more, also expand on in the Arabic version, is for example, you have. Hibat al-Din al-Shahristani, which was uh, uh, a major figure uh, of al-Nahda in Iraq, uh, uh, come to Bahrain and, you know, he's a, uh, a prominent uh, uh, Shia scholar and also one of the 
main figures in the uh, 1920 uh, revolution and an educational reform coming to Bahrain in the 1912s and asking and for a school to be uh, open, uh, opened. And one of the main people he um, interacts with is Migbil al Dakir or Haj Migbil, who was actually, you know, who was born in Nejd and came to Bahrain. Uh, and obviously is of a more uh, uh, Hanbali uh, uh, tradition. So, uh, so basically, it's interesting to see how the two actually s struck up a, a close friendship, it seems, in Bahrain and how these uh, interacted across um, the region. So that's, I think, one thing that definitely needs more work on these connections. And the other that I wanted to mention is also the rise of modernized absolutism, which Abdul Razak has done... Uh, uh, initiated the conversation on, on how to understand it and uh, also in Oman. But uh, also I think it's important to look at the different connections and how they spread across the Gulf. So what I try to argue in the book is that Bahrain was the first place really in the Gulf where this form of modernized absolutism was born. And the connections it had and based on Maud Zafrul, for example, in the India princely states and in Iraq and how this, I think it's important to for uh, maybe in future conversations to look at how did this then spread and take different forms across the different uh, Gulf Arab states uh, through that. Um, I know I've taken too much time, so I'll just... Oh, no, it's fine. Uh, so we have uh, uh, some answers uh, were received also from uh, from the panelists. Sara has, uh, has written, uh, you know, an answer to uh, Hasna Mukhtar's question. Uh, she's encouraged her to uh, uh, engage with the Association for Middle East Women's Studies. Also, um, Dr. Crystal Innes has also uh, encouraged people to uh, look at uh, A-gaps. Um, uh, Mohammed Sidari has encouraged everyone to, uh, to engage in more exchanges between critical scholars embedded in the field of Gulf studies and those in other areas such as China studies. I know that uh, Dr. Sideri himself uh, is a pioneer in this regard uh, and has, uh, has spent uh, a considerable amount of time and energy uh, uh, and scholarship uh, in, in China and encouraging um, a joint uh, kind of uh, exchange between China and the region. So uh, this is uh, uh, all, these are all very ex exciting suggestions. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, Jasim's question on the Arab Spring. I think it still has not been addressed. We also uh, have uh, uh, we have a comment from Ahmed Al Maazami uh, about uh, the Indian Ocean world offering an analytical framework to situate the Gulf in a broader historical geography and scholarship. Uh, I have some thoughts on that, but maybe Omar, uh, we can start with you. And actually, maybe we can also uh, uh, hear uh, from Amal after we, we, we hear from you, because I think uh, the Professor Ghazal uh, is really a, a pioneer in, 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 this, in this field. Uh, so go ahead, Omar. I think let's start with, 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 uh, with Professor Amal, and uh, I think she's, she's much more uh, knowledgeable on this on me, and I'll add my thoughts after. I know we've had a lot of discussions on this, so uh, it, it's, uh, oh, yeah. So Professor Ghazal, uh, uh, do, you, do you have any uh, ideas about this uh, comment slash question about the India Ocean world offering uh, an analytical framework to situate the Gulf in a broader historical geography and scholarship? I think the reason Omar, uh, uh, you know, threw the ball in my court is because we had been talking about this for a while now, both of us. <laughs> So he's, you know, an accomplice in, in this discussion. Um, I'm eager, okay. Um, I mean, it's interesting for me to discuss this particular topic right now because I am somehow situated in the Indian Ocean, being in Doha. And we never think about it in this way, right? Uh, Yes, yeah, somebody mentioned, just mentioned Fahad Bishara's recent article in August 2020. He argues the same. So basically, uh, in my book on Zanzibar, I talk about the Middle East and the, and the Indian Ocean and the connections between them. And I remember at the time when I mentioned the Indian Ocean, it, it, it became natural in a way that, that this is where Zanzibar is. This is where Oman kind of, you know, uh, also is situated. 
And at the time, I wasn't thinking about it as an, as, as an analytical framework. It's later, after I had published my books and I started to, you know, to think about other projects, that I became more versed in the literature on the Indian Ocean as an, an analytical framework. So I agree with the suggestion uh, for sure. Now, it doesn't mean in our case that this framework of analysis is independent of other frameworks. Uh, for example, as someone like me who works on the intellectual, on modern Arab intellectual history, the Indian Ocean is part of the story. The Indian Ocean offers an analytical framework in a sense that if we look at the connections between the Gulf, East Africa, and, uh, and South Asia, uh, of course, we have a comprehensive analytical framework by itself, and it tells us a lot. But for me, especially if I'm looking at Gulf studies, that's not enough. I need to make other connections. I read uh, uh, Fahad Bishara's article again a couple of weeks ago. And um, what's interesting is my take on the Indian Ocean in Arab history is an intellectual one. His take is more kind of, you know, a trade and migration. And Fahad, I felt that Fahad in, in I, I wish he was with us here, Fahad um, insulated the Indian Ocean with his suggestion that we incorporate, incorporate the Gulf in the Indian Ocean. For me, that's not enough. We should do this. And I think we owe it. We owe it to the Indian Ocean and we owe it to the Gulf studies to, uh, kind of situate the Gulf in, in that frame of analysis. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't belong somewhere else as well, because that's, you know, you cannot isolate those regions from each other, especially if you're thinking in terms of being Arab. So for me, the net, the intellectual networks incorporate the Indian Ocean in the Mediterranean, in the Sahara, in the African continent, and thus the Indian Ocean is not isolated from, from the rest. For Fahed, it's a different take and he sees things in a, in a different way. So it, I'm not saying this is the wrong approach, but in my case, it's not enough. So that's what I wanted to say in, in this uh, context. Yeah, th thank you, Amal. Um, I've, I've just noted uh, uh, that uh, uh, Ahmed al mazemi says, I'm here. Uh, and Ahmed, of course, uh, engages in uh, a PhD uh, at the moment on uh, on the subject of Indian Ocean interconnections. Uh, so any contributions? Uh, uh, oh, no, that's Fahad Bishara. Okay, but uh, sorry, Fahad, we're receiving your messages under the name of Ahmed Al-Ma'zami. Uh, so I, <laughs> I apologize. Um, if if you would like to join the, the conversation, we would love to to actually uh, include you. That that's always uh, uh, wonderful to have on these uh, panels. Fadi, is there any chance we could uh, uh, include Professor Bishara uh, in the discussion? Because uh, I do think this is an important uh, note, and maybe he wants to uh, engage with uh, Amal and Omar um, and others in in, uh, in discussion about that specific point. Yes. Uh, so uh, Professor Bishara, as you said, is under Ahmed Al Mazemi. Uh, that is correct, yes. So there are two Ahmed al um on this call. Could the one that you want me to unmute please raise their hand so I can unmute you? Okay, perfect. Um, right. Give me one second. Uh, they should be unmuted now. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Uh, how are you, Dr. Bishara? How's it going? It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Sorry, I had to log in through Ahmed's link. Uh, no I couldn't problem. find my own. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, in, in response to, to what Emil just said, I don't think I ever uh, would suggest that, that, uh, that the Indian Ocean framing should somehow replace the, the Middle East framing, but rather that, um, that there are uh, opportunities for engagement with Indian Ocean history, and, and it's a field that I identify with very closely, um, that uh, might help us move beyond the Gulf and, and uh, chart out uh, sort of new processes, new periodizations, uh, and new connections. Uh, your 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 book, uh, Dr. Takriti, did some of that work. Emma's book has done some of that work. I think a lot of us are uh, uh, are now uh, understanding that there are 
that the, these Gulf actors, intellectuals as well as, um, as traders, uh, are mobile uh, and that they're, they're reading in all sorts of different places. Uh, and they're plugged into discussions that are taking place in India. There are the discussions taking place in in Zanzibar, and you know, and 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 that is just the Arabs. Uh, I would, you know, I would uh, caution against a notion that Gulf history is somehow only Arab history, uh, because then we end up uh, marginalizing or at least or actually totally erasing all of the other ethnic groups that are also that also make a part make up a part of uh, of Gulf society. Uh, and through through whom we can, and through this Indian Ocean framework, we might be able to to get a better sense of of how to read these sorts of things. Um, I, since I since I'm on on camera, I, I would I would like to to uh, reflect on one point that was brought up during the discussion that I would I I would love to get uh, uh, Omar yourself, Dr. Tikriti. Uh, um, the rest of everybody in the, the panel to, to maybe speak to a little bit more. Um, I, I totally understand the hesitation uh, in a sort of uh, the sort of singular use of, of colonial archives. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's a defensible position anymore to say that we can only use colonial archives. I'm similarly wary though of this notion of the sort of the, val the valorized local source. Uh, as though the, the local sources are, are somehow um, uh, distinct from uh, the sort of colonial relations of power, uh, as though the people who are producing these are not already embedded in a landscape of power that has been reconfigured by a colonial presence, uh, and as though the vernacular is somehow distinct from uh, a, somehow distinct from the language of colonialism all the time. It's not, right? Anybody who reads these sources knows that these things are entangled in one another in all sorts of ways. Um, and that the vernacular itself uh, vernacularizes, domesticates a great deal of sort of colonial knowledge. Um, the, these are people who are reading texts produced in other language. They're incorporating concepts into the vernacular um, that that uh, one might not have seen in uh, in centuries or even decades prior to it. Similarly, of course, we now know from the work of lots of lots of other people that the colonial the colonial record itself is is built on vernacular knowledge, right? On local forms of knowledge. So the the distinction between the two is in many ways a to to draw a, the sort of dichotomy between the two is to sort of posit a a false dichotomy, and I I believe that. Everybody in this room probably already uh, already knows that, but the the difference is that um, uh, uh, that we are what we are that this, the the direction in which the discussion was going, I think is it ends up um, uh, ceding too much power to uh, to colonial authority to say well colonial officials can come in and reshape categories and we are left with the the detritus of of colonial history. This, this ends up robbing us of any agency in the process. I'm actually really glad that, uh, that to have you and to host you here, uh, Professor Bishara, because uh, first of all, I'm a big fan of your work, but also uh, because I think we need to uh, actually start a very serious conversation about all of these uh, uh, issues. And maybe such a conversation uh, uh, can allow us to also hone uh, our own uh, conceptual uh, takes on them as a feel. Um, um, I think that uh, the one thing that caught my attention, and I really think there's two conversations here. Uh, one has to do with the Indian Ocean uh, question, and the other one has to do with the colonial archive, but they're interconnected. Uh, so the first one is, I think the real issue is how can we strike a balance between the interconnectivities that this region has with other parts of the world. And as a region that had a very particular set of economic relations with the rest of the world, of course it was interconnected. Not just with the Indian Ocean, and this is where the Indian Oceanic turn might be too limited, like Amal was suggesting, because the region has very strong connections with Iran, has very strong connections with the Ottoman Empire historically, uh, and has very uh, strong connections, of course, with all the Arab regions of that empire and the Arab regions that were not in that empire. So 
uh, the Arabian Peninsula dimension of the Gulf should never be erased. And there are, I'm sure you would agree, uh, uh, Fahed, that there's a serious problem in the erasure of the Arabian Peninsula dynamic. Once you start uh, erasing it and you, and, you, you, and you externalize it as a factor, you see it as a foreign factor in the region, that allows for all sorts of chauvinist discourses around that region that are rooted in anti-Bedouin discourses, that are rooted in all sorts of other uh, formulations that you are very well aware of. So how to strike that balance and how to uh, not engage in this uh, colonial project of negating Arabness without pursuing a chauvinistic Arabness and, with, and, and how to create an inclusive vision of this society that is empowering, how to create empowering knowledge for all components of Gulf society, you know, whether they come from uh, the Arab majority or whether they come from uh, Persian or uh, East African or other points of origin. And I really think also we have to be careful and, and not de-indigenizing those, uh, those uh, communities as well, because a lot of them have been in the region for a very long time and, and they're part of the social fabric. So to also just imagine them as Persians or as uh, East Africans would be, uh, uh, and com would, uh, would be complicit, a form of complicity in, in the exclusionary project. So this is, uh, I think, the challenge that we have to uh, face. I agree with you that, as you know from my own work, I agree with you that it, it is complete failure to, to methodologically and historically to exclude the region from its transnational and global connections. But it would also, we have to be very careful about uh, enforcing a diluted cosmopolitanism as opposed to a genuine uh, inclusive diversity. Uh, uh, so that's the balance. I, I don't think we've still reached that stage where we've kind of really arrived at that balance, but maybe we need a conversation. Uh, in fact, I think we should uh, host a, a panel or something on that. Maybe we can bring you and other, and Amal. But, yeah, I, I wanted to say- You're a fancy, you're a fancy dean nowadays. Can you, can you host? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. Since we're, uh, you know. You're our uh, yes, so we well, need your help. No, first, you know, given where, we, where I am, right, and uh, my argument that Doha is not, you know, in terms of Indian Ocean and the Arab world and the two coming together. So it may be a good place to, you know, in collaboration with other institutions, host the next session. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that would be amazing. And I, I think maybe we can involve uh, uh, multiple institutions and scholars in that. And maybe that could be like, uh, uh, you know, a new directions in the field kind of conversation. That would be amazing. There's some interest from uh, uh, Qatar University to do something on the Indian Ocean. So uh, I can... I, I think maybe it should be about methodologies in the field and not just about Indian Ocean. Like, like where is the field heading? And maybe bring in all these different voices and that would be amazing. We can frame it any way we want and do the next step. And Venice that's... is ready. Matteo, just, you know, go away. Yeah. <laughs> Venice is everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're getting a lot of uh, comments from uh, Muhammad uh, Sabah. Uh, is it Sabah or uh, if uh, Muhammad? If you can write your name in Arabic, because uh, I, I don't always know in English uh, how to pronounce things. Uh, yeah, but basically, he seems to suggest that basically the book uh, 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 ignores systematic historical continuities of Al-Khalifa, tribal uh, violence during conquest, uh, and uh, critical class analysis of uh, nationalist movements and their problematic view on slavery and violence against the uh, Baharna. Uh, is he, uh, he's asking, are you replacing a colonial gaze with a, a bourgeois gaze? Uh, very interesting. Uh, and furthermore, uh, Muhammad has a suggestion. Muhammad, can you please write your name in, in Arabic, please? Um, I've read your book and found no progressive or enlightened uh, quote by today's standard other than that uh, of an intellectual bourgeois coterie close to the Al Khalifa royal family or those deposed, deposed by the British managed to get together. I'm not clear on that sentence, but 
basically, I think what he's trying to say that I'm not sure what he's trying to say in that one, but pe people can read it in the chat. Uh, but basically, he's saying that you found no progressive or enlightened quotes by today's standards in your book. Uh, do you have any ideas about that, uh, Omar? Um, well, I mean, I um, I I need to read it. Um, I think. It, let me just quickly take a look at it and the chat. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think one thing that I will I'll focus on there, which I, uh, I I I try to address in the book, and I think also needs to be more uh, on it, is all, is trying to look at the. Um, uh, instead of you know using uh, categories of sex and ethnicities, is try to engage that with a reading of uh, different uh, modes of uh, production, if you want, or economic classes uh, within that, and how to be able to look at, for example. So, for example, one thing that I argue is uh, when you only look at it in terms of sex, that does not get looked at, and I try to look at it a bit more is for example, the different dynamics between urban towns and what goes on in agricultural villages, because there were very different dynamics going on there. Um, the urban towns uh, were uh, you know, much more in terms of uh, their dynamics closer to, I guess, what was going on in Kuwait uh, or Zubara, et cetera, which were uh, based on pearl production and on, uh, and on trade. In the agricultural villages, uh, because uh, you know there were many dimensions uh, to look at there, there was one of the most important local factors that I try to emphasize is that there was a direct relationship of coercion between members uh, from sheikhs and people in the agri uh, in the uh, agricultural villages, and so you know you had uh, taxes such as sukhra uh, and lurgabiya uh, imposed on uh, uh, agricultural villages, which were different than the, um, what was going on in the urban centers. And this I also then tried to, uh, to, uh, uh, to contrast to basically, for example, the kind of relations of production that you have, for example, with pearl diving. Where pearl diving, the relationship was much more, or the relationship of coercion, let's say, was with the ship captain or the nochida. And so it's uh, what I try to uh, uh, do in the book, and I think there is much more need for it, is try to look at these different intersections between, for example, urban versus uh, uh, agricultural villages dimensions and how this intersected with, uh, with, way, uh, uh, with production, with sect, with ethnicity, and how uh, basically... What I, the main thing I put forward when we're like trying to look at the 19th century is that you had basically uh, a society that was based on difference, a lot of difference. There was not the, the idea of equal citizenship did not exist. And so you had a lot of differences that uh, intersected across urban, uh, rural dichotomies, uh, uh, what was being produced, uh, the ethnicity and sects versus also obviously family and regional events, that these kind of intersections uh, need to be looked at much more carefully to understand uh, the dynamics that are going on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, um, I attempted to do that in the book on to look at what was going on in the 19th century. Um, uh, I think this was chapter two or chapter three. Uh, people can take a look at it and make their mind up about... Uh, the arguments I put there and the intersections between, uh, yeah, class and different modes of uh, of uh, agricultural relations and how these also intersected with politics and uh, the other elements involved. I, sh I, sh I should note that uh, uh, Omar's book appeared in a series that uh, I happened to co-edit, mm. uh, which is uh, the Radical Histories of the Middle East series. And uh, that's co-edited with uh, Skandar Sadiqi, Jardi and Raznaqato and other uh, uh, other scholars uh, who are concerned with overcoming uh, the divide uh, between uh, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Mashriq, uh, and Iran, uh, and who attempt to uh, overcome the chauvinism that we have seen as a, as a, as a result of the uh, ultra sectarianization of the region. 
And I think it's, it's very important to situate, I, uh, and this is one, my, probably my last comment on your book, Omar, and then, of course, uh, we don't have much time. We're going to wrap up, but uh, maybe we'll leave time for one question and then uh, we conclude. Um, is that what, what I found fascinating of, of the book was that it really struck a very delicate balance. Uh, it managed to avoid uh, the, the current, uh, the, the biggest current methodological challenge that we face. And it's a silent challenge. People don't articulate it, but I have to be very honest with it. I'm, I'm a straight shooter when it comes to these things. Um, at the moment, as a result of the geopolitical clash between Saudi Arabia and Iran, across the region, we have a polarization around that clash. And this polarization has lamentably taken a very sectarian form. As historians, we not only have a responsibility to confront that, and I, I believe we have to confront it, not just avoid it, but also uh, we, we have a, a responsibility to protect uh, the past from this, uh, 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 from this teleological gaze of the, of the present uh, that's based on the, uh, on the worst forms uh, of, uh, 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 of values and norms uh, that, that we see prevailing in the present. Uh, uh, what we're seeing today is really horrific on the epistemological level. We cannot be drawn into uh, that situation. Unfortunately, in a small place like Bahrain, with its uh, 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 long history of uh, violence, uh, uh, on the part of the regime uh, and uh, it's long uh, against uh, a, a very sectarianized space. You know, this is a, a situation where the regime does have a sectarian agenda. And we know this uh, from before through Bandar Gate and other, uh, you know, I can say this. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, very clear about that. Okay. I know a lot of Bahrainis cannot talk about this, but uh, I think Omar actually has uh, spent a lot, a lot of time talking about these dynamics, but the reality is there is a sectarian regime project. But at the same time, that sectarian project cannot be confronted with an, with an equally sectarian mentality or a sectarian epistemology uh, that attempts to uh, de-indigenize sectors of Bahraini population. Or to, uh, to go back to uh, our conversation with Professor Bishara, to detach it from, to detach Bahrain from Arabian Peninsula dynamics. You know, when you come and say, I hear, a very, I hear that nowadays, people tell me, well, the Al Khalifa were settler colonists on, uh, in a, in a conquering force. I'm like, okay, how do you account for the Utub migrations across the Gulf then? And how do you account for the relations of conquest uh, that have to do with nomadic and settled populations across the Arab East, including in Bilad al-Sham, including in Iraq? It is not uh, atypical for uh, an organized Bedouin tribe to come and conquer a rural production site and to make people uh, uh, to extract rent from that. As an economic relation, and uh, uh, Professor Hani is with us here, he knows this very well, that is one of the features of that particular mode of production in this period, okay? Uh, you have a, an agrarian economy uh, and, the, and the political tension is expressed in a struggle over resources between uh, nomadic and uh, agrarian groups. That is, that is standard, okay? Um, when we view the dynamics in the region through that lens, you know, that invites us to introduce a serious conversation about class and about how sect can sometimes benefit class and can be used by dominant classes to justify relations of domination. But the way to, to, to confront those relations of domination is not to then internalize the sectarian visions and to dream of a society uh, uh, based on notions of, well, here are the original people in, in Bahrain or in any other zone and everybody else is an Aghrab or a foreigner. Okay, we're dealing with this, by the way, I'm, I'm currently grappling with this in places like Jordanian history. There is a whole history now of talking about Jordan in terms of Aghrab and, and uh, uh, original populations. There is a whole range of histories that, that do that in other 
zones. The problem with them is that they come out of a, a certain pain in relation to the authorities, a certain pain emanating out of social tension, a certain pain emanating out of exploitation, okay? But what they ignore is the fact that liberation does not come through internalizing oppressive logic. There has to be a vision of a common future in any zone we're talking about. And I, I, what I love about Omar's book, and I'm being very honest here, is that it's a first step towards attempting to construct such a vision. In the same way, um, I'm a huge fan of uh, Osama Makdisi's work on Lebanon. What I love about it was that it was telling Le the Lebanese people, you do not have to be stuck in this framework that, is, that assumes sectarian identity as permanent, primordial, and all-encompassing, and it's the, it, you'll never get out of it. Let's look at how it got constructed. And I think Bahrain needs, desperately needs a conversation like that. The rest of the Gulf desperately needs a conversation like that. A very honest conversation, a very open conversation. Um, all right. Um, uh, if anybody, uh, Omar, would you like to uh, conclude because uh, we really ran out of, uh, out of time, uh, but I, I very much uh, would like perhaps uh, each panelist to give like a, a one minute and then, and then we, we, we give you a word and then, and then we're done. So Amal, would you like to start, uh, please? Again, remember it's 9.30 PM here, right? <laughs> I'm done for the day. Uh, uh, no, again, I mean, I'm again, like you, Abed, I'm a fan of Omar's work. Um, he is situating the, the Gulf region, in this case Bahrain, in, in different historiography. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what's interesting about Omar's work. He's not a trained historian, but I read him as a historian. You know, like he is a historian at the end of the day. And he is giving me tools as a historian that I may miss uh, in my training. And uh, all that I can say is I'm looking forward to more publications, Omar. I don't want to talk more about, you know, specific details uh, uh, in terms of your work. I'm just looking forward to more and more of your work. Thank you. Okay, uh, Adam. Professor Ania, are you there? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I went, I, I echo uh, those comments and uh, I, as someone who uh, works much more on the contemporary region I, I think it's really interesting the way a lot of the issues that were raised uh, in this uh, discussion resonate around uh, contemporary problems. Um, for example the whole question around Indian Ocean um, I, I think it's, it's a broader issue of how do we understand uh, I, I think some of the ge ge geography debates around spa uh, space and scale um, can bear a lot on, on these kinds of understandings and perhaps present some interesting ways of connecting histor hi historical uh, debates with, with the contemporary. Um, in other words, seeing space not as, as something um, bounded and fixed, but something that's produced through social processes and, and social relations. I think that crosses both the historical and, and contemporary debates. Okay. Uh, and uh, Sultan? Yeah, thank you very much for this amazing panel. I am uh, looking forward as well for Omar's future endeavors. I think uh, it is true that Omar is a, his training is a, is a, is a, in economy, but uh, I sympathize with his dealing with the history of the region because as a political scientist, I found myself when I want to try to, to write uh, about the region, I needed to engage with the historiography on how the history of the region was uh, written and how it is understood. I needed to uh, grapple with that. And I learned from him and I'm uh, looking forward for his future endeavors. Okay. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Sara. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me to this um, exciting conversation. Um, I'm deeply humbled as a graduate student who cite a lot of your work and um, and just to be among so much of my um, own inspiration is, um, is, 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 uh, is very special. 
Um, I am excited to read more of Amar's work and um, yeah, I guess like for me, it's just like the thinking of um, how do we, how, how do we weave the contemporary with the historical and sort of like bring those conversations together has been like very, very much um, at the center of my thinking about um, uh, schooling and the purpose of schooling and the work that schooling does uh, within this context of Bahrain. Um, and this is the beginning of a conversation and I'm just excited to see what's coming next. So thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Wafa. Yeah, I just would like to thank you all for having me today. I actually want to give the rest of my time to Umar to comment. Um, and hopefully this is the beginning of further discussions to be had um, and, you know, uh, further responses and commentaries on the region. So but the rest of my time is for Umar, so he has more time to talk. And uh, Umar, uh, thank you very much, Wafa, uh, for your uh, generosity uh, and uh, and your engagement, your wonderful presentation. Uh, Omar, uh, there, there is a question uh, that we forgot to cover, and I've received a reminder from uh, the questioner about it. It's from Ibrahim al uh, Houthi, or is it, al, uh, I think, al Houthi. Uh, again, it's very difficult to read in English uh, Arabic names. <laughs> so it is not a question, more a comment. Uh, I wish to know how Omar can comment on the idea that the Gulf is not one. Most of the Western literature considers the Gulf as one, mostly similar in everything, uh, but, but it, it, is, it is not. Uh, so he says this is what uh, uh, creates misunderstandings of the region. Uh, do you have any comments on that, Omar? And then perhaps your concluding remarks, please. Yeah, I mean, I think one theme that seems to emerge, and I think this is something I tried to grapple with in the book, but I think overall we can also try to grapple on elsewhere, is, uh, you know, these binaries that I think also Sarah uh, talked about. That, like, for example, one binary is, you know, uh, local forces within Bahrain versus colonial uh, effects. One is reading colonial sources versus reading local or Arab sources that like Fahad Bishara brought up or now that basically is the, you know, or is the Gulf part of the Indian Ocean or, you know, part of the uh, Arab world or now is the part, can we talk about one Gulf or different Gulfs? I mean, for me, at least when I tried to write these books, the one of the main motivating factors is to try to go beyond such binaries and try to look at how do they co you know how do they co constitute and describe how do they co constitute um, obviously you know a critical reading is needed of arabic sources and local sources uh, they interact with those of the colonial archives some is based on uh, on it while also arab uh, the readers then were reading the colonial archives there is this uh, engagement between them Similarly, the Gulf, you know, engages with the Indian Ocean economy, engages with the Arabian Peninsula economy, engages uh, with Iran. So how can we think of these uh, productively? Um, to also emphasize this again, um, uh, you know, ethno-sectarianism is not only, uh, you know, a colonial uh, uh, production. Obviously, there are local events on the ground. In fact, I... You know, this is what I always start with, is to try to start with the local forces on the ground. This is why the first chapter was trying to without outline. Interrupting, without interrupting, that's a point that uh, Abdul Nabil Akri has a question about, which is to what are, to what, are the, what are the limits of British modernization while preserving the traditional tribal rule and the fragmentation of society along sectarian ethnic lines? What are the aspects of the Bahraini and Nahda movement confront the British as a force that dictates... Uh, 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 backwardness and what is common and different in the British and the ruling family sectarian policy. Sorry to interrupt, but I know that you were starting to talk about that, so I wanted to introduce uh, Abdel Nabi's, uh, especially since he has a long tradition of activism against these uh, forces. It's worth uh, asking his question. No, exactly. Like I think the idea is, uh, you know, to try to look at how these productively engaged with each other. So, I mean, just to take for example the. Uh, forces uh, on the ground in Bahrain. So I try to talk a lot about how the 
uh, relations of coercion involved in different spheres of economic production. As I said before, for example, in the different agricultural villages versus uh, what was going on, for example, with pearl diving and in the urban centers versus uh, agricultural villages uh, and how this basically uh, the interaction between this and also then issues of sect uh, of the uh, structures created on the ground uh, involved in this. So Abid mentioned one that we didn't talk about, for example, this idea of divided rule is once uh, the British had a direct foot on the ground, how did they, you know, institute different uh, institutions of sovereignty, courts, uh, uh, the uh, city council of Manama, uh, the Majlis at Tijar, etc. And how these interacted with local forces and events on the ground. The whole idea, I think, is to try to, again, move beyond these binaries which are important. I think these categories are important to look at and how they emerge, but then look more importantly at how are the different forces within them uh, emerge. So yeah, the book was an attempt to basically look at, the, uh, look at these categories and realize their importance, but also look at the different important factors that played uh, within uh, the different uh, networks, within uh, the different uh, relations on the ground and how they uh, produce them. So, yeah, I mean, I again, I look forward to more and more uh, conversations. Hopefully we can have so many were brought up. I think the idea of, you know, how can uh, Indian Ocean and Arab uh, studies and Middle East studies productively engage with each other, uh, the, uh, you know, engagement between colonial archives, local sources, more regional ones, um, uh, citizen foreigner bi binaries and how these emerged, et cetera. So um, absolutism and how the different forces within them emerge. So in the end, yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for such a vigorous and uh, uh, yeah, and I hope very productive in the discussion. And I really, really hope that we have more of them and that we are able to, uh, to, uh, to engage with them uh, in the future. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Abid and Fadi for, for organizing this and hopefully to many more. The, the, the honor and the pleasure is ours. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you to everyone who attended. And I would like to uh, give special thanks to Fadi Qafaiti, who is the Assistant Director of the uh, Arab American Education Foundation Center for Arab Studies at the University of Houston, uh, for all his hard work on this panel and for making it uh, happen. Uh, and I hope to see you in other events. We have, by the way, a major international conference that we're co-hosting with the SOAS, University of London, and with the, with the Institute of Law at Birzeit University on the Palestinian right of return. That's coming up this Saturday. So please register. Uh, it, it will be uh, an exciting event with uh, lots of leading scholars, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, Rafif Ziyade, Nimr Sultani, Karman Abulsi. We have, we have an amazing array of people speaking on this important issue, uh, especially now with the deal of the century, especially now with all the attempts to liquidate the Palestinian cause. It is more important than ever to center the right of return and talk about it in a very serious academic way. So I look forward to your participation uh, and uh, see you in future events. Thank you, Professor Shahabi. Thank, Thank you very you. much, guys. Thank you. Congratulations on an amazing book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank you, everyone. people who interacted.